Welcome to the Metro Council Budget and Finance Committee's um, budget wish list session number one. Uh, this is our opportunity to talk through all the options that are in front of us. Um, we are not necessarily making any decisions today, but um, just want to go through what's on the table and uh, discuss relative merits. And then hopefully by Monday, we will have made decisions. So uh, I did hand out an agenda, which I will more or less stick to. So I'm going to go through just a couple of guiding principles before we get started. Um, and just for background and context, I have um, both emailed everyone and provided a hard copy of the GFOA recommendations. GFOA is the Governmental Financial Officers Association, um, and they are the ones who um, come up with best practices on how cities should run their government. And that's, um, that's kind of the gold standard for all finance directors around the country. So our finance director is also very committed to trying to move Nashville toward operating under those principles. So that's that's our goal. It is not necessarily um, where our budget policies are at this point. We will, um, when we finish the budget process, I think ask our finance director to, um, to do some laying the groundwork for our filling in the gaps in our, in our budget policy uh, later on in the year. So that's, that's to come. But the, the key things of the GFOA recommendations that I want to make sure everyone is aware of are number one, fund balance. Um, they define that a fund balance in best practices should be two to three months of operating expenses. And in very rough terms, that's two months would be about 18% of your budget. Our charter says we have to have 5%. Um, and so we have done a great job of getting above what our charter requires. Uh, and we are, we think, close to what best practices require. Um, but I just want to make sure that people are aware um, that our fund balance looks really great simply because it has not looked great for several years. Um, so just by comparison, it looks fantastic, but keep in mind where it should be. And then secondly, um, the GFOA also talks about a structurally balanced budget. And that's, um, that's language that we've been hearing for a couple of years now because we had several years where we did not have a structurally balanced budget where we were selling property to make our to make ends meet uh and councilmember mendez was eloquent about talking about not selling your furniture to keep the house going it's a good analogy so we don't want to get into that habit again um so those those are there if you want to read the details on them you've got a handout on that um, and then finally i have my very crude four-year look ahead um which is just looking at um, where our budget has been set for the past um, five years since 2017 um, and then where kind of based on where what the pattern has been if if we just inflated everything at five percent which is a really crude way to do it and our finance director is doing a real job of this and that takes a lot more time so her, hers will be much better uh, and it will it will come later but in the meantime just to give us an idea of how this year's budget fits in the context of down the line, I, it's helpful to me to have things in a chart, as y'all probably know. Um, and so that's it. Councilmember Pulley is holding it up. And essentially, all, the, all the, the stuff in the past is the budgets that we've set for past years. And then I looked at this year and said, if we added $75 million in new property taxes from the things that have come online, and if everything else grew 5% because inflation has grown from the 3% that we used to see, what would our budget look like this year? And in that scenario, it would look good. And it turns out actually we had considerably more growth than that. And so we've been able to do a lot more things with this budget, which is very exciting. Um, if you take those same principles and take them forward for the next couple of years, the 75 million, which is a lot more than we've gotten from growth in any of the past years, you can look back and see that and 5% inflation, you can see on the, on the right-hand side where I have the, um, each, each of the, the two sections, the revenues and the expenses have a total. And in all the past years, they balance because we have to have a balanced budget, it's supposed to be structurally balanced. Um, but if, if our growth is a very solid 75 million from increase in, in property taxes and our expenses go up 5% and every, all our other revenues go up 5%, we are not balanced in the future. Um, so that just means we need to be thoughtful about what we do with our budget this year, just to make sure that we have um, left ourselves in a good solid position for what our growth looks like coming up or what inflation may do. So 
that is that is purely an engineer trying to do financial analysis. So please, you know, don't put a whole lot of stock in it. We'll get a much better version from our finance director when she gets the professionals through with that. Um, but but just to try to get our arms around, you know, what happens as things move forward um, is, is because we have a great year this year. Does that mean we'll have a super year next year and the next year? And this doesn't take into account pandemics or tornadoes or civil unrest or things that we know happen now. So um, that's just to set context and, and ensure that we are um, just considering all possibilities as we now move forward and try to look at, um, at our wish list. So um, I feel like there's a comment coming. Council Member Mendez, you're recognized. Thank, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, just because I'm, I'm running out of years to say this before I'm gone. Um, I think what you just described accurately reflects the years you've been in office. Um, but keep in mind that before you were in office for a bunch of the time that Mr. Edelman over there um, was working for Metro, there was, a, there was a four or five year game plan where there was an affirmative planning of what do we want to do as a city and then looking at revenue projection and then making the tax rate cover what happened every three or four years. Right. And for the entire time everybody in this room has been in office, Metro government has absolutely not ever done it that way. Doesn't even have a, a multi-year projection at all. And instead has done it the way you described of saying, gee, how much money are we gonna have? And then spending from there. And if we really, really, really want teachers to remain the best paid in the state, and we wanna be right-sized in all our departments, then we have to go back to how it was done from uh, you know, the first quarter century of Edelman's career um, of having an actual plan about what do we need to do as a city, then look at revenue and then set the tax rate accordingly. And, and that, like that's, I hope to God you all do that um, sometime in the next uh, four years rather than um, handling it the way it's been handled most of the last uh, decade and a half. Duly noted. And as I've said, our finance director is working on four year look ahead. So I think we're laying the groundwork to do that. And I appreciate that, that comment on that. Um, before we get to the, to the specific wish list items, um, I want to start with the, the one big item that we've been talking about for almost a month now, I think, um, which was the change in the state's BEP formula amount that it had said that it would provide to Metro schools after we had set and blessed their budget. That was a $22.6 billion hole. Um, we've been working with schools on that since uh, we became aware of the, of the change. And they've agreed to, to work on a third of it. So they um, have identified $5.5 million in textbook funding that they can move to ESSER funds and that solves that problem. They're looking for another 2 million, which left us to find about um, 15 million on our side. And I have passed out, um, I think a summary of very likely places that we can put together $15 million to fill that hole. And I believe that is kind of the first thing we have to do before we start making any other changes to this budget. So as we talk through possible funding sources, it's possible that there's some overlap here. So we simply need to be aware of that and may need to get more creative in looking at funding sources or as we get down the line, um, look to make some hard choices. I mean, ultimately we'll have to make hard choices anyway, but I just want people to be, uh, to be aware of um, what has kind of been laid out for that. That's not to say it's the, it's the final call, but um, a whole lot of work and thought has gone into that and some other possibilities have been laid out that had a lot more impact on departments uh, and what's, what's placed here hopefully can be rearranged in a way that doesn't impact services or, um, or any um, output from the from departments on that. So are there any questions on any of that background that I've laid out before we jump into the wish list items? Council Member Hancock. Do we have any explanation from the school district as to how they're able to cut $5.5 million in textbooks? What adoption year is it? How much they were projected to spend? They are not cutting it. They are moving it to ESSER funds, which were one-time funds from, um, 
from the federal government that they would like to have used for something else, but there may be moving it from ESSER funds to textbooks, and that's how they're able to take the 5.5 off. Correct. Correct. They Super. are still buying the textbooks. Our children will still have Yay, textbooks. Thank you. Great question. Anything else? Okay. Councilmember Mendez. Just, um, I see the line item for fund balance um, says eight million, and uh, the. Are, are the, you looking? I'm sorry. Where do you see? It? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. You're back on my list. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah, and the note is one-time cost from various departments, and I guess I understand from a conversation with uh, Miss Flannery, um, and just want to make sure that I've got this right, that um, that reflects um, finance going through the budget, looking for um, non-recurring expenses. And after shaking the, the whole thing, panning for non-recurring expenses, um, came up with 8 million. And so based on the best practices about making sure to not use fund balance for recurring things, this is the sort of, uh, well, I'll ask a question. Does this max out the re non-recurring expenses such that there's no it more is, fund balance to use? It is every non-recurring offense that has, offense, um, expense that has been found so far. Um, and I, I have not seen the, the total breakdown of what those items are. I mean, I, I, I welcome folks to say, I think I found this and is it in here? And, um, between Ms. Flannery and, and, uh, and Ms. Wilson, I think they can let us know if there's an overlap there or not. But they've looked they've looked pretty extensively, so it's it's likely there is not a whole lot left. But okay, you know, forty eyes looking is better than two. So I think she'd like to say something. Um, I hear a voice behind me. Yes. Sorry, I need space. Um, <laughs> just to be clear, that is not schools fund balance. That's general operating funds fund balance. These are not right. cost exclusive to schools. This was us looking in the full $3 billion pot. Gotcha. I'm going to get y'all a mic. Um, thank you. That's a great clarification. Can you say that one more time just because we're recording? Oh, sure. I just wanted to clarify that the $8 million ish that we've identified is not exclusive to schools fund balance. It is the primarily a GSD. Uh, there's, you know, it's allocated across, but um, that, that fund balance pot. Gotcha. Is that, is that clear to everyone? Councilmember Zora. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, commend uh, the Chair and uh, Ms. Flannery for coming up with that eight million because I think all of us, as we've been talking about, we're ready to go to fund balance to make this all. It was not our fault. It was something that we found out later and we're re we need to do what we need to do to make the school all. So finding a way to do it without going against our structural budget, as she's explained it, I think it's uh, commendable. So I'm just glad that we're able to make up this uh, 22.6 and then we move to the next one. Right, and there, and there are more. And at this point, I want to kind of stop and acknowledge some um, some great um, resources that we have in the room, starting with the back table. Um, Mr. Tom Middleman, our treasurer, and Kelly Flannery, our director, and our great support staff, Hannah Zeitlin and Margaret Darby, and Maria Calder, who has worked really hard putting all the uh, the items into a, an order, organized structure for us, which I appreciate. And then Kristen Wilson from the mayor's office and Mike Jamison and Shannon Hunt, thank you for being here. Um, I'm sure y'all will be called on at some point as we talk about options. Any any other questions on the school $22.6 million hole? We can certainly come back to it as other other things maybe in overlap. Council Member Pulley, use your mic if you would. Um, items that you're, uh, uh, okay, if you want to real quickly run through them, I will, I will do that. Um, I, just, I just have a question on a couple, if that's okay. Okay, let me, let me do them in order just, and then, uh, and then shout out just so we'll, so we'll have talked about those. Self-insurance, liability, and judgments and losses are both um, <clears throat> numbers that we have to keep a balance of based on actuarial data. Um, we have, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the right technology is. There is money sitting there now in, the, in a fund balance, uh, and we are adding more to it. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room before we start getting into not being where the actual where data says we're supposed to be. Um, so that one is uh, probably one of the one of the ones that I think makes the finance people a little bit nervous, but they felt like we were under a threshold there that they were comfortable with. Um, so any questions on those first two? 
And then on the on the benefits, this is um, employee benefits. We very conservatively set a money aside to be able to pay that every year, and and um, it is anticipated that we put aside more than we need, and that we can shift 1.5 million of that over. Um, and then MTA. This one is complicated. I'm going to let Miss Wilson. Can you come up to the mic and explain this one? Um, thank you. I've actually, I'll, I'll defer a little bit to our OMB colleagues because they okay. have the direct conversations. But just from a historical point of view, because I was um, here for it a couple of years ago, you'll recall that in the FY21 budget that we did, that we made um, a pretty dramatic cut to the MTA subsidy because they had CARES funding that had come through that could be used for either operating um, or for capital. And again, incredible partnership and we're incredibly grateful to them because they called us and said, we've had this coming. We know that there's a crisis in front of us. We can make these resources available. We'll be okay on our subsidy. And so you all recall, I think it was on the order of 26 or 28 million. Last year we restored that, but they actually had still some of that CARES Act money available and last year, they did, we gave them permission um, to use a little bit of it, uh, and they used a little bit of it. There's still actually about three million left, and so um, they they've been holding it in case they've needed it to continue to help. And this was a situation that came up where they, out of the three million they have left, one million we figured could be useful um, to help in this in this scenario. And, you know, one of the conversations we actually um, had amongst ourselves was, you know, we feel kind of good about this because to, to, uh, uh, to Council Member Mendez's point about thinking in multiple years, you know, we have a reappraisal coming in two more years. So one third of that, if we really ended up in a situation we had to persist forward, they're, they're covered for essentially three years out of that, that remaining fund for that million if that makes sense. But I don't, I want to make sure our finance colleagues had conversations with them more directly than I did. We, we did talk to MTA and they, they do have plans for the money, but feel that they could comfortably shift those to other, to other resources as, as they move forward. So they're willing to, to uh, use them, use the million dollars. They wouldn't want to go above that, but they could do with the million dollars. Thank you for that explanation. Questions on that one? Um, okay, so MNPD and fire, they both have within their their budget items that are under the operating budget that, that technically because their equipment or supplies could also fit under the description of the 4% fund. Um, so that was just a suggestion to move that to, to funding that will come under the 4% fund. Yes, okay. So when, when they're removed from this and, and put to 4% fund, uh, we won't see a 4% allocation until December. Is that correct? So we still have one more 2022 one to do. We'll probably bring it in early July. Um, mm -hmm. That money doesn't expire, so it revolves. What's special about these two, it was a kind of a first time only in this budget because a lot of the 4% for these two items were the, kind of the same things every year, and it really was things that they just needed in their operating budget. So since we had additional funds, it felt like a nice opportunity to put it in their ongoing operating budget, knowing that they were going to need it, but we could move it back to the 4% just as easily. So I guess my concern is I didn't know exactly where this money was coming from. And, um, uh, there's about $1.3 million worth of uh, equipment and supplies that they were kind of, uh, asking for in their, but that they were asking for in their budget, uh, which included some items that they really needed and without being able to, uh, uh, have the money in the operating budget and make those plans and, and uh, send out uh, whatever information they need to start securing this stuff, one of which is a records management system uh, that's now tapped out because it, uh, uh, it was first initiated in 2009 and it's sort of antiquated and they've run out of data space for things like, um, uh, you know, taser use reports and use of force reports and things of this nature that are necessary in this date and time, uh, that would be pushed back. And that's what their, uh, the police department's concern is about that. So, uh, I just wonder if, if those are part of the expenses and, um, uh, I'm just a little bit concerned about the time gap there because 
they won't get the money until they get it if it's in a 4% fund and um, that might delay these things. So be my concern. Yeah, so these, this is new. These are not things that were typically in their operating budget. And like I said, mm -hmm. we will bring them right. up to 4%. Exactly. In it's July of 2022, right? Yeah, yeah. I think last year we did it at the same time, but we recognized with this gap that it might make everything a little okay. hairy. So we just put right. it on pause. Thank you. So the goal would be to get it into their operating budget. Okay. Ultimately, but if we if we need it this year, we can do that next year. Thank good, you. Good question. Okay. Uh, Thirty nine curbside delayed the expansion <clears throat> of some of those. They um, have not begun that process, but had said they would like to. But um, when asked if they could uh, pitch into the effort, that was uh, an item that they chose. They said they could wait on and and get to later. Um, and then same thing with the parks on the greenways police. Um, that they they would love to get some police on the greenways, but they would be willing to delay adding seven of those, and that would put 500000 in. And then finally, um, NDOT, one of their items was markings and sign, which um, if is, is technically a capital expense and therefore can be moved under a capital budget, which um, will, will then have an effect there, but it will at least solve this problem. So that's the, the final item on that. Questions on that or anything else? Okay, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you. Just for clarification on parks, uh, delay seven, that's delaying seven FTEs? Yes. Okay. So they had asked for 14. Okay. And that's just, to some degree, acknowledging they may not get them all hired this year anyway, but making it more official than they probably wanted. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Druffle. Yeah, just a quick question. Did then that uh, marketing signs go into the CID? So that the, that I'm going to defer to the. B that we just approved. Correct? Yeah, I, I know the, this whole budget modification was 1.3 million, and the idea was to bring some of it in house. The, the, the building and painting and doing whatever they do with the signs. And then 300,000 is, is uh, personnel, to op personnel to operate that. So instead of running this through their in-house shop, they would do a contract and they still keep the personnel to do the sign. The sign. So it's, it's not really new process. It's just they were going to move some of it in-house and now they're going to continue the contract. So it doesn't need to be in the CIB. That, I think that yeah. was the question. Could I, we, we couldn't hear it back here. Okay, um, I, could you maybe just summarize? Move the mic a little closer. Sure. What the original modification was 1.3 million, and we're only removing a million of that. The 300,000 was for personnel costs, but the the construction and the and the production of the signs was going to be moved in house. Oh. That is going to remain as a contract instead of moving it in house under this under reducing the million dollars. So. It wouldn't really affect the capital piece of that, I don't think. Thanks. Okay, good questions. All right, with that, if Councilmember Suara. I, I just wanted to, to make some clarification for the sake of the viewing audience, is that we all need to understand that one of the reasons why the finance director was reluctant about fund balance is that the fund balance that we're looking at is it as of FY22, and we don't really know where we will end when we finish uh, FY21. So we wouldn't know what we would be until we actually end this year. There is, for those of us that we're pushing for use fund balance, we think that when we finish this year, we will be in a better position. But there's no way for us to know any of that. So that's why the shifting of some of these items is happening. And uh, for those that may be worried that the seven will not pick up again, I, I do believe that we will pick them up because we will end up in a better position by the time this year is ended. So just wanted to provide maybe some sort of clarification. Good condition. Now, I think that's important to, to know. Council Member Swope. Thank you. And some of this may be redundant, but again, for the viewing audience, and I don't want to sound like Satan, not wanting to support the school systems, because I absolutely do, but did anything in the BEP calculations change from last year to this year as far as the state's concerned? Yes or no? The BEP formula did not change. It is very complex, and it depends on data that only the state has. Okay. That's question one. Two. Do we have less students in our district this year than we did last year? Yes. 
and that would be the reason for the $22,600,000 hole. There are three components in there. One is our fiscal capacity, which is a number that is, is apparently very complex and subject to change, apparently, because our fiscal capacity continues to grow. And that was, that was one number that, that changed between, and to, to say this, Metro Schools was given an estimate from the state that said, this is what we think your BEP funding is. And that was the number they were working with when they finalized the budget with the mayor. And usually that number is updated in the middle of April and the state did not come back until the end of April. And what changed between the middle of April or the, the end of March when they had given their previous one? I don't know. I mean, I, the state knew those numbers as well at that point too. I don't know why the state changed their numbers. Uh, but probably NMPS because was relying on, on the numbers that they had been given. Probably we had less students. Um, and if there's less students, it should cost less. So I'm wondering, why are we trying to fill a hole that, from a logic standpoint, doesn't need to be filled? That, that number of students didn't change between March and April, though. So I don't know why. I don't know how MNPS would have anticipated that the number would change that dramatically between March and April because okay. the student counts happen at different times in the year. Yeah, it's uh, good questions. hard to calculate, but just, again, I, I have constituents asking me these questions. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? And we do have eight pages of stuff to get through. So, Councilmember Cash. Uh, my understanding was that the, we're actually, I saw some numbers, we're actually up from last year, but there was a hold harmless like, a few years ago. Oh, oh. Turn your mic on. Bring it. There was a, we are actually, I saw numbers from uh, Sean Braced that we were up from last year by, I don't know, five or 600, but we're still down from before, from like when COVID happened and we, Lost Correct. like thousands, and we're, so we're up from last year, but we're not up from where we were pre-COVID. Um, is it working? Yes. You're good. Okay. Um, I, and I, I kind of want to. I don't know if I want to say I want to agree, but I think with charters, with uh, state-run school districts, with enrollment, like I do think that we should have better. This should have been better anticipated, and we may see some fluctuations based on enrollment in MNPS schools and charter schools and state run schools like the achievement school district, which are part of BEP, but not under MNPS. So I do want us to encourage going forward, like encourage MNPS to have a plan for if numbers go down, if enrollment numbers go down, how, how are we going to deal with it so that we're not doing this every year? Okay. I mean, I'm glad that we were able to, that you were able to um, find money to fill the hole, but I think annually we're going to need to anticipate and also they're going to need to get plan to recruit and get those numbers back up right, right? we will communicate that to mnps thanks good point any anything else before we move on to eight pages are we ready okay let's go <laughs> so uh my hope for today is that we can get through many of these are the same item just just initiated by different people so hopefully we can take several at once um, possibly with the, and and also the funding sources are going to begin to become redundant so we won't need to rediscuss them every time um, but my hope is that we get through all eight pages of this um, and let everyone have a chance to make their case um, for the item that they have proposed um, and then we've got the weekend to sort of think about it and then we'll come back on Monday and try to put things in some kind of order Monday our um, our quadratic voting folks will be here and we'll explain that process in detail so all I want to say for now is similar to our CIB prioritization everybody gets 100 points but unlike that they count more if you work in consensus with people and they count less if only one person just puts a whole lot of votes on it so th this is our opportunity to explain to other people why what we're advocating for is important and possibly to try to reach some consensus um, because that's that's um, I think the items that the most people feel are important are the ones that should rise to the top. So with that said, um, the uh, one of the biggest ones that we're gonna talk about is the pay plan improvements. Uh, and there are two pieces to that one. Well, there are three pieces to that. One is for Metro employees. That's what we're talking about here. And then in a minute, we'll get back to MNPS employees. So does everyone have this legal size piece of paper? That's what I'm working our way through. Correct. Starts with GSD, General, General Fund, Reserve Fund. So the first item is um, under administration pay plan improvements. As we heard at the public hearing, many people have asked to go with the 5% COLA as opposed to the 4% COLA. Is it not? Yeah. 
let me link it. Um, okay. And that is, um, and Ms. Hall, maybe you can tell us, we have, we have several different numbers here, 6.7, 6.5, and 6.0 million dollars to add the 1% back to the COLA. Can you um, share a mic with the vice mayor over there and tell us which, which, which number would do that fully? And if so, there's anything else we need to know about that. Sure. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you. Um, Welcome. So the total number for a 1% COLA just for Metro government, not schools, is 6.7 million. That's the total cost. However, I'm going to kind of glance at my finance colleagues. Um, majority of that comes from the operating, the general fund. There is a portion of that my guess is give or take a million that may come from other funding sources. Tom, are you keeping me honest here? That's correct. And think of the biggest one is water. They pay for their own. So that's the 6.7 number includes water as well as there's a, a myriad of others, but uh, a, a million dollars is about right. Yeah. So the total cost is 6.7, but arguably maybe you, maybe I'm saying this wrong, but I'm the non-finance person you may have to solve for something slightly less, give or take a million, because those other funding sources. But from the general fund, the total cost is 6.7. From the general fund, probably somewhere around like 5.7, 5.8. From the general fund, 5.7, 5.8. Okay. According to finance. So like they are, I trust the finance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we have, um, there were four suggestions here, uh, and so maybe it sounds like the six million would adequately cover what needs to come from the general fund. And then if we raise it for the water employees, that will be absorbed in the water rate? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, no. And hopefully that's taken into account. Or from somewhere. those other enterprise funds, there are a sundry of forces, but the biggest one is the gotcha. enterprise fund at water. Gotcha. Um, and on this uh, on this piece of paper, I see a lot of y'all have laptops, which is good because in the um, if you've actually got the, the wish list called up, Ms. Calder may have sent that to everyone. Yes, Ms. Calder has sent that to you. There's a hard copy and that, yeah, that may also have the multiple, that's got the multiple sources. So um, I just like spreadsheets better. And I believe that it's in a slightly different order on the, on the other one. But if you go back to, if you look on page two, general government. So the options to fund this were, um, I'm going to let uh, the various sponsors talk about it then. Councilmember Gamble, you were one of them. Thank you. And it looks like this is uh, incorrect as far as one of the sources that I um, identified for this particular, for the COLA, the main source that I identified was the 4% fund. Okay. Um, so I'm going to let... One of, one of the administration people talk about the 4% fund and how, when we can and when we cannot take money from the 4% fund. Who wants that one? Ms. Wilson? Director Flannery. Okay. Pull it, pull it, pull it. Okay. I'm gathering my thoughts. I okay. wasn't ready. Take your time. Uh, so the 4% fund, also called the general fund reserve, which that mystery will remain with me forever because it's not a reserve at all. Um, mandates that 4% be kept in there for equipment-esque type purchases. Last year, well, current year, fiscal year 22, as well as the 23 budget, we've actually funded it at 5% because the needs have just gone up. Um, what we were able to do, I guess it was back in January, was you all approved a supplemental that allowed us to clean out the kind of, I think, eight-year backlog of equipment that we had in there. But the struggle continues, and it's not just acquiring the commodities, but it's the price of the commodities. So um, the need is still there, and it remains there. There is no um, requirement for how it comes out, um, specifically to your question. But so when we, quote, take it from the 4% fund to use, I mean, can't can we take money from the 4% fund or, or reduce the 4% fund? So we have, the budget is contemplating the 4% fund is actually 5%. Right. So gotcha. you could change it back to four and still be compliant with the policy. So, so how much, if, if we're at 5%, if the budget has it at 5% now, how much would be available to bring it down to 4%? 10 million. Thank you. Okay. Yes, you may. Ms. Wilson. 
<laughs> um, I'll just add, you all have an extensive fact sheet on this, but one thing I want to flag is back when it was still a 4% fund, there were a number of departments that will tell you they were underfunded. And that was in particular, I'm, they'll probably even say it at 5%. We have 133 million of department requests and we've categorized them in that fact sheet. Now we've added two more million in the move that we made with the 22 million, a million from fire and a million from police um, into that. So now 135 million of requests. And as it stands currently, it's about 55 million if it's funded at 5%. And I just wanna be clear in terms of the impacts, right? We outlined a prioritization process that we use at least in our proposals to you all on how that 4% fund gets utilized. And a lot of the departments that end up getting impacted when we cut back and even feel probably that they're not um, adequately funded today. We're talking about libraries, books and materials and equipment in the libraries, um, parks, uh, a lot of the kind of baseline maintenance equipment that occurs because we will prioritize first um, safety equipment for our employees and productivity equipment for, again, the substantial number of FTEs that we're bringing into the budget. That helps. Thank you. And thank you for reminding me um, I forgot to mention the fact sheets that y'all have worked very hard to put together um, that were sent out. And um, if you haven't had an opportunity to read those, please please do go back because there's there's really great information about a lot of things. So that's that's the other homework over the weekend is to read all the fact sheets. Um, so that's the four percent fund as a possible funding mechanism. The other Chair Allen, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. One more question. Okay. If if we dipped into the 4% fund now, is there opportunity to add funding back into it after the end of the fiscal year from the fund balance? I'm going to defer Ms. Flannery. I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. I guess what I'm saying is if we reduce from 5 to 4% to, to take care of some of these wish list items, but knowing that there is a need to increase to 5%, is there an opportunity once the fiscal year ends and we know what the fund balance will be to put money back into the fund to get it back up to 5%? So the 4% the fund's a little bit different in that it, it's almost, I don't want to call it a revolver because it doesn't replenish itself, but it, it never really expires, right? So like I just said, we're going to do another... 2022 funding, but in fiscal year 23, it's because we've collected that revenue and we have it. So I think not answering your question, but I think telling you what you want to hear, if the revenues in fiscal year 23 come in higher than what we've appropriated, which we won't really know because the first one's not till December, property taxes don't come in, you know, January, February, we wouldn't realize it. But if there was more revenue, in that time frame, we could come back to you, council, and ask for an increased appropriation. But again, that wouldn't be known until yeah, early in calendar year 2023. Good question. Any other questions or comments on that one? Um, I don't see council members O'Connell or Lee here. Um, their funding mechanisms were, I think, from various places. Uh, Take, take new FTEs not identified and or debt service funds, which um, can someone speak to whether you can take money from debt service funds? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hard no. <laughs> so X that one out. I'm sure that was in one of the fact sheets. Okay, great. And then Councilmember Lee had um, multiple funding sources, reduced reserves, which we've already talked about, um, the district energy system, which is uh, its own enterprise that that has to yeah, provide services to downtown buildings, including this courthouse. Um, elimination of PIO with title, $3 million for voting machines, $30 million from MTA and $3 million elimination of lobbyist contract and $2 million from MLF. If anyone wants to speak to those, otherwise we'll move, we'll move on. And then uh, Councilmember Toombs, who's been in this role before and knows how to, how to, how to make things happen. You wanna <laughs> speak to your, your creative solution. And Chair, if you don't mind, I'll also speak to the Minority Caucus okay. items as well, and it's right after me. Uh, so my suggestion, as well as the suggestion of the Minority Caucus, was to add an additional 0.5% COLA to make the total COLA for Metro employees exclusive of MMPS to the 4.5%. 
uh, on my individual sheet, I listed um, taking um, the three point three million three hundred fifty thousand from the self-insured liability fund uh, for the minority caucus. We did not tie a specific funding source to each item. We just lumped all of the possible funding sources together. And so this is what we came up with, taking 3 million from judgment and losses, 1 million from the MMPD recruitment bonus, 100,000 from the GSD contingency, 100,000 from the USD contingency, 3 million from self-insured liability, 500,000 from master space planning, 4.44 million by having all of the new FTEs that we have for this fiscal year start mid-year, which is, exactly what we did last year. I can't remember if we did all departments or just pick some of the departments, but we did do a mid-year start. Um, 291,000 from the contingency utility increase and 500,000 from technology review. And that gives you about 12 million 900,000, I think is what the spreadsheet says. And that's but in I, the spreadsheet. Yeah, that's okay. in the spreadsheet that we submitted. See spreadsheet, okay. Duly noted. In, any other comments on the 5% COLA? Great. Uh, next council member, um, let's see. Sledge had asked for B cycle stations in South Nashville. Um, that would be $50,000. And he had asked for that to come from the 4% fund. Um, so that is equipment. Is that an appropriate use of the 4% the fund when it comes up? Or, um, or are there other ways to consider that a one-time <coughs> fund and pull it from somewhere else? I think either one. Um, if you wanted to know definitively that it was going to be in the budget, that you were going to get funded, I would I would encourage you to find $50,000 in the operating budget. Otherwise, we, you know, when we bring a 4% back, you're all going to have to wink, wink, smile, smile, right. and remember to fund it and rely on each other. So, Okay, there it is. And one other point, I mean, that... I, I don't know the specifics of it, but that sounds like a 4% kind of purchase. So I don't know how you would pull it out and put it in operating when it would be pulling out 4%. So, it, I mean, that one's, it's what it looks like. It is a 4% purchase. It, it looks like a 4%. Okay, any other comments or questions on the, the B cycles on the Greenway being funded by 4%? Okay, uh, Council Member Johnston had requested to put $1.3 million into the fund balance uh, and take that from police money. And I would ask, uh, I guess, our, our director, we did, uh, in one very difficult year, put $98, $98 million into the fund balance because it was so depleted. Are we, are we in a position where we feel like that's something we need to pull out of, of uh, our revenues to put into the fund balance? I've gone back a few years, and I, I don't... So Talia tells me an a anecdotal story of back in the day, one time, there, and I don't know if it was that same $98 million, but... Um, We've talked about the fund balance policy currently, you know, not being appropriate at 5% and it should probably be closer to that 17 or 18%. When we look at the projections for how we're going to end 22, I think we're right in line with that. So that, that is why we didn't include a budgeted fund balance um, appropriation, which um, you would have seen in the ordinance with the fund balance estimates where 22 matches 23. If we had done that, you would have seen kind of that increase in there. I'm comfortable, um, provided we don't go wild here today, that <laughs> the estimates for 22 don't warrant the need for a budgeted amount. Okay, thank you for that. Any other comments on that uh, request to put money in the fund balance? Okay, let's move on to Metro Council. Um, Council Member Welsh. Thank you, Chair. This is, um, these are expenditures to bring Metro up to uh, full Title VI compliance with the federal government. Um, and um, this would simply, we, I believe we have $25,000 already allocated into the council budget, and I would like to add an additional $50,000 um, to uh, change over one of the uh, Metro National Network channels to um, a dedicated um, Spanish channel so that all meetings broadcast within Metro would be simulcast in Spanish. Um, this is the first step. Um, the $25,000, um, we are going to be starting a pilot program, hopefully within the next couple meetings um, in council where we will be having um, live simultaneous Spanish translations on a screen in council. So you'll be able to look at the screen and see the whole meeting translated into Spanish as well as into English. And if that is successful, hopefully next year using the additional $25,000, we can add an, uh, the second most spoken language in um, 
Nashville, besides English, which is Arabic, we can add an additional screen to have also have meetings simulcast in Arabic so that we can um, increase language access for all people in Nashville and they can feel like they can have more participation in their government on a day-to-day -day basis. That, that is great. Have you identified a funding source for that? Uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber. Okay. Um, and I know that it was sent to me, but I haven't seen the email. Just uh, for context, um, what the value of the chamber? Um, one hundred seventy-five. One seventy-five thousand is what is in the contract. Um, I know that there is some information on what that contract has yielded, and I'm afraid I, I am not being able to get onto the. Uh, I can't get onto the network right here to see that email. The Chamber's actually lost quite a bit of membership um, and in the recent past has only recruited two new businesses and not to Nashville but to um, other counties within Middle Tennessee. So I feel like that's a very, very appropriate um, expenditure. In addition to their advocacy in terms of um, un trying to undermine our school system um, and our, our Board of Education. Um, so I think it's a very appropriate expenditure given the return on investment has been very poor. Thank you. I will, I will find that and forward it just so we'll have that additional context as well. But I, I appreciate that information. Any other comments on that? Council Member Swope. Thank you. Do we not do closed captioning in Spanish right now on all of our broadcasts? We do not. Really? Wow. Okay, thanks. Good question. Okay. Uh, all right. On uh, Move on to... Um, Department number four, the mayor's office, we had um, council member Bradford had um, a request for two FTEs in the mayor's office of economic development that would come from the Dell payment. Can I get someone who can speak about the Dell payment? Is that Ms. Wilson or Ms. Flannery? Or Mr. Edelman? The Dell payment is a contractual payment to Dell based on the number of positions they have, uh, have created in the given year. They bill us. Uh, we ver ECD verifies it and then we make the payment. So we don't know what that is on an annual basis, but uh, it, it, it's a contractual obligation. If, if they submit a bill, and we validate the, the jobs created, we'd have to make that payment. Okay. Everybody can hear that? So that's a, a contractual obligation. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the, the, Dell, con the, the uh, Dell contract is a contract that we have signed with them at the end of the year they 35 years ago it's the longest one it was and we've learned a lot since then however um it is based on the number of employees they bill us if they don't bill us we don't pay them if they do bill us we are contractually obligated to pay them it's, it's when, when is the expiration date of this deal 10 more years yep. Exciting. Years. Yeah. but it opened the floodgates yep. We won't talk about that. Okay. Uh, no, no comment. Council member, Chair. Council members, uh, pardon me. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, based on the numbers they've been submitting, how much of the 500? I know that in COVID, we got them to not accept the 500, but in pre COVID, how much have they been billing out of the 500? Can someone. Although, how much that have question? they been paying? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can get that information for you. Yes. If we can get how much we've been paying, then we can see whether there's anything left in there to use. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Darby, are, can you, are you going to keep track of... Yeah, I'm, I'm. Bless you. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to lose it. Thank you. Um, all right, Council Member Stiles, Office of Mu Music, Film, and Entertainment. Thank you very much, Chair. So this was adding uh, another 125000 The mayor has committed $100,000 to the creation of this office, but it is only for a director position. The office would actually need additional staff. And so if this is to be a functioning office that does need some additional funding. And uh, your funding sources were? Are... Sorry. So I had uh, 285000 from the crime prevention from the police uh, budget. Also, uh, 556000 from special events from police. And then I had 100000 from parks, from the sportsplex. Okay. And that's for multiple things that you, yeah, exactly. you added in there. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and can, can someone address when we do special events and have overtime for police? Is that now, I'm thinking we've done a better job of making sure that's covered by. That's my understanding as well. Anybody? 
Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that's money that actually is in the general. I mean, I think it only comes in if it's going out for, for the special events. Council member Pulley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's several times in here where police budgets uh, being asked, uh, items asked out of the police budget. And I guess the easy thing for me to do is, do you mind if I hit them all now and get it over with? That would be great. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> be, you, as be I great. said, some of these are going to repeat it a lot. So. Yeah, they are. Um, so let's talk about crime prevention and analysis and just what that is. Uh, these are civilian positions and they're analysts with te technical expertise focused on extrapolating data to help with the strategy of precision policing. You may remember the other days, the older days, which were under uh, a little bit of criticism where uh, the police department would target high crime areas and cast a wide net uh, and in hopes of catching a few fish in that wide net. Well, precision policing is much more intricate and and targeting uh, very specific areas. I don't I don't want to get into very uh, great deal of detail because I don't think it's uh, wise to do that. Uh, but you know, crimes increasing, and without those technical experts, what the police department would have to do is put sworn people in that position. And you know, I know we have divergent views of uh, public safety here, my dear friends on the other side of this issue, and me, and I respect those views, uh, but. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we don't need to put sworn positions in there and take them off the street because, like, like I said, crime's on the increase. And what I hear from people is uh, they want more officers out there uh, doing tasks that they can't do right now, like work accidents and create traffic calming. So that's the crime prevention and analysis. Uh, I've seen the recruitment bonus, and we heard our police chief talk about uh, his efforts to really step up recruiting. Uh, and he's done a, a dynamite job in being able to get other police officers from other departments to come on board with us uh, and, and using incentives to do that. Uh, you know, we've had a number of lagging positions over the years, uh, pushing 200, and now we're making a pretty significant dent in it, so much so that the police chief was asked to go uh, up in the Northeast and speak as, as to why he is so successful and other departments can't be. And uh, just a reminder of the numbers, we've got 109 scheduled to graduate this year, oh, excuse me, in the current academy classes, and we've got 66 new recruits starting in August. Uh, to try to attack our shortfall. And uh, the one thing that's preventing us from being able to do that is the facilities to put more people in there. So, um, you know, I would hate to take the incentives away uh, from, a, from a program that is working where we need this. Um, you know, um, the co-response task force, I would say uh, it, it's important to communicate with the police department, the fire department, and the coast department to see how that would uh, uh, kind of impact uh, that situation. So um, that's all I have to say right now. Great. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing that out. Um, anything else on that? Um, you want to talk about participatory budgeting part-time position? I think that's you, Councilmember Stiles, or maybe a minority caucus. Is that Councilmember Toombs? It's myself and the minority caucus. <laughs> so uh, we all know that the capital spending plan, both last year and this most recent one, includes uh, $2 million for the participatory budgeting pilot, which has gone extremely well and has resulted in some excellent, excellent capital projects um, in my uh, district, uh, as well as uh, District 1. Um, it is a heavy lift to do that process. Uh, Fabian uh, leads it, um, even when he had another uh, employee in the mayor's office helping him, they were still overwhelmed. Uh, and so I think that it is important so that this program can be as, as successful as possible, um, that there at least be a part-time person helping with that process. It would be a, a great benefit to, to Fabian and to the process. And again, funding comes from that, that whole that bucket that you would look at. Of okay. sources. Good yes. to know. Um, and then the Minority Caucus, you've already talked about the Office of Film Music. That's the same same position there. Thank you. Any any comments on the participatory budgeting part-time position? Okay, we're moving along. Okay, next is uh, Department 7 Planning Commission. We have two items there. Councilmember Welsh um, is advocating 290000 for their unfunded FTE positions. Can you talk about those positions? 
Um, I can't really give you a lot of detail on those positions, but um, uh, Director Kempf had asked for four full-time positions to be funded and only two were funded in the mayor's budget. Um, and given how this city is growing and how important planning is as we grow, um, I feel like we need those uh, positions funded so that the office can be effective and can address the ever-changing needs of the city, um, particularly if we are going to be embarking on things like the redevelopment of the East Bank and things. And my funding source is um, MMPD, which we talked about. Okay, thank you. And then um, housing planner and planner manager is Benedict. Thank you, Chair. So, um, and that may be those two positions. Pardon me? Maybe that is those two positions. That is okay. correct. Yep, that is correct. So, and it's a planner, not a plander. Um, but that's okay. That's I'm, I may adjust. That, that looks like it was probably my fingers in a copy paste. So during the budget hearings, um, the planning department nailed that number down for me. Uh, for all of us, it was two hundred forty-one thousand dollars. So that are that is the two unfunded positions that were in the planning department's request. I have that money coming from um, Greenways. I'm going to have to look at exactly what there were a, a number of things in the parks. Sorry. If, you don't mind. It was from Greenway staff. There was an additional Greenway staff um, allocation, and that's where this comes from. And um, if I might just speak to that, because I'm on the Greenways Commission, and I've gotten several phone calls from people um, just saying that there is so much development happening now that uh, it's very hard for Cindy Harrison on her own to keep up with making sure that land gets, um, that easements get created and set aside now while we have them, because if the development happens and they build on it, they're they're gone forever. So that's that's a it's kind of a, a timing issue there. They were less um, nervous about the police, but we've already taken seven. But maybe we could take one or two more. So I would say what I've heard from parks, and well, what I've heard from the greenways people is, they feel uh, much more strongly about the planning people than they do about the full number of police on the on the greenways. They do want some. They, they might not necessarily have to have 14. I know seven is what the Parks Department said. I just throw that out there for, for context. Councilmember Hancock, also on the Greenways Commission. Previously, I'd love to still be on there, I'm but sorry, you know, I, miss you. I rotated off the committee, so therefore I cannot. Um, I could be maybe a city member at large on there if anyone's listening. I would just like to bring up the fact that so far we've already heard three different times that we're cutting parks and we have six total on this list and parks budget was stagnant until last year even though the land that they had to serve kept getting larger because they would have donations of more land gas prices get higher we keep raising the coal like they have more expenses so we really need to fund them and I think in the last two years with COVID everyone maybe 90 percent not everyone has been using our parks more and more so i don't think it's something that we need to just feel like is something we could cut and that we don't need it's a part of our livelihood and our health thank you sure. council member tombs just to point out for parks I, I think that most if not everybody wants to support parks and give them exactly what they need they do currently have a lot of vacancies and they have struggled a lot as many employers are struggling right now to find employees. Uh, I think this is possibly where the mid-year start suggestion may come in mm -hmm. for parks. If they can do without those positions for six months, um, then that's, that's maybe an option to free up some funds, but not taking those positions away completely. Good suggestion. Thank you. Um, Chair, can I clarify the number? So yes, I, I, thank you, Chair. So this is two out of five of the planning positions for Greenways. Just okay. want to clarify, there are still three that I've left there. Okay, no. duly noted. Thank you. Uh, okay, then any, any other comments on the parks? On to uh, Department 11 Historical Commission. Uh, also Benedict restored the placards budget. 
Thank you, Chair. So this is something I've got one in my district, and this is when we talk about neighborhoods. And last night during the East Bank meeting, we talked the the topic came up of neighborhoods and making sure we're investing in neighborhoods. There's a lot to celebrate out in our neighborhoods. Forty thousand dollars is just a small amount of money that would make a difference for every single. Um, district in this in this county. It's a budget that hasn't been funded in quite some time. I have one in my district that is from that I want to uh, celebrate next year, a 60th anniversary of something. And so I would certainly love to do that on, with um, uh, to to celebrate that and get that done. Um, certainly could fundraise privately, but I really think this is something that's for the civic good. Thank you, um, Councilmember Van Rees. Um, it's, it's my understanding that those cost about three thousand dollars each. So, what, where did the forty thousand come from? That was a number that Tim gave me, um, and I think that what that is is, uh, is he said that that's what the budget was before. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess from what I've heard in the past is that during a term, council members, district members typically get the opportunity to put in one per term. Yeah. So, I think forty times four years gives us the amount. That would work out for all 35 council members to do one during their term. I've got to do that math, oh, I but you. that's. But I, I believe that that's what. what that's, was, that's the number. Thank you for helping me with the math. I didn't do the math off the fly. Let's okay. just on okay. the fly. I just wanted to make sure that, that there was enough. If if this were to happen, that each council district would have this equal benefit. That's it. Thank you. Good question, Councilmember uh, Styles. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to mention. Last year, that had been a request that I had had as well because it hasn't been fully funded in several years. So thank you, Councilmember Benedict, for bringing that up. We do need to have these. Thank you. And can I, this one, uh, the, the funding was from the self-insured liability. Would it be possible to get the actuarial, the actuarial information on what, where we need that to be and, and how what's in there now and how what we're adding to that relates to what needs to be in there? Yeah, I actually just followed up with law and said they're coming for your money. You better get a fact sheet Good. Get together <laughs> quick. Um, so they're working on that. They're working on that. Okay, yeah. so that's that's another one to Starby. So huh, if we just don't do anything, we get sued over. We don't need it. Uh, sure. Councilmember Van Rees. In Count follow up, in follow up with that, um, these are signs. These are. Uh, is there any way that this could come from four percent? Can these signs come from 4%? It's signage. It's equipment. I mean, I think per the letter of the policy, perhaps, but it's such a... It's equipment. It, it, yeah. it covers equipment and repairs, and I would think that this would not be either. It's definitely not repairs for buildings, and I don't think it's equipment either. And, and, and this is a charter. It's not a policy requirement. It, there may be grants out there, though. I mean, that's another thing to look at. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Council, Council Member Toombs. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to follow up on the self-insured liability, if we can also get an up-to-date accounting of how much has been used so far by the legal department. Yeah, they're, they're doing all four funds. Right. Okay. Four, four or five, yeah. Fantastic. And property lost at four of them that, okay, thanks. that me looked right for the, the coming after. Council Member Hancock. I'm totally in favor of the signs. Love them. Okay. Um, I did do the math. I did 35 districts times 3,000, 105,000 divided by four years would be 26, 250. Couldn't remember. I had to look. Um, I'm, I'm fine with 40, but if we need to cut back a smidge, we probably could and still have that average going on. But I do um, love the ability to recognize these historic structures that we want to keep. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, right. Sure. Councilmember sure. Benedict. Just, yeah, we're talking about 40,000. The, the director of the department told me it's three to 4,000. It depends on the number of letters. It depends on any images. Right. The, the, the request from to me was, when I asked and pressed, was 40,000 will put us back in the budget they used to have. Gotcha. That's Thank a nice you. round number. Okay. Like Anything else on signs? On to uh, Council Member Suara. Support it. Record that I support it too. Okay. No, that's good. Um, so uh, on to Department 22, Juvenile Court, court Clerk, Councilmember Druffel had asked for a youth program coordinator. To sort of give them a heads up of some of the juvenile, uh, some of the rehab and some of the programs we have that are going to bring uh, career development 
and uh, they felt there was a, a great opportunity to uh, get a program co coordinator. So as, as these kids come back in, there's job and, and, and career opportunities that can dovetail. And we thought that'd be a great coordination also with the mayor's office, with a, a, a youth coordinator. We thought that would uh, fit right in. So uh, they felt like this position would be very useful. And, and not duplicative? Uh, no, not okay. at all. They, if you remember, they were flat on their request. Uh, and this is this goes a long ways to actually uh, create opportunities for people coming back into the workforce or creating opportunities and options for them. Uh, gotcha. And and I took uh, out of parks, um, sorry, uh, but um, I looked at uh, very similar as the Council of Tombs and said they are way behind if we took two people and deferred for six months. Great minds, things alike, and uh, that would probably be the same. And I don't think that would actually hurt them from gotcha. what we've heard from them. Uh, Thank you. And just, just so everybody knows, the way we do our budgeting is we look at what we spent last year and then departments have to ask for additions to that. And so interestingly, when we, when we start something mid-year, then the following year they have to ask for More. the rest of the payment to, to do that. So um, if we do that, then next year we will see um, an item that says make up the rest of the year, which that, that, I mean, that, that may be fine. But again, think about our four-year look ahead as crudely as we have it. We'll get a better version later. Um, and, and, and keep that thought in mind as well. But um, I appreciate that clarification on that. Anything else on juvenile court clerk? All right, uh, item uh, department 31, police. Uh, let's see, this is from, I'm not sure, is the pay equity request from Styles as well as the co-response? Okay, anybody own that pay equity? All right, uh, you wanna speak, speak about the co-response? Yes, please, thank you. So. Over the last few months, I've been speaking with codes department, fire department, police department about the creation of a co-response task force that would work from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., five days a week to handle any of the codes and fractions that come in that apply between those hours. There are a lot of things that are happening when people know codes can't come out to investigate. So uh, in having this task force, if codes has to go out at night, there would be a police officer to go with them. If there was an emergency that came out fire, could also go with them. And so we've also been talking about how to utilize the hub to do all of these works. Great, thank you. And that would be, that comes out of your bucket? Uh, yes. Okay. Specifically this, the special events that you brought up before, so. Gotcha, okay. Um, any other comments on that one? I will say, as we've talked about short-term rental, it has been frustrating to know that no one will go check on things nights and weekends. So there's definitely a need for that. Uh, Councilmember Benedict, School Safety Study. Thank you. So I put in this request very last minute uh, on Tuesday night. We celebrate, we honored um, the heroes, the three heroes that uh, held the man at Inglewood Elementary. And so this is the result of that. In that, um, in, during that incident, we realized that there's both school security and MNPD. MNPD is in charge of SROs and crossing guards. MNPS is in charge of school security. Some are armed, some are not. And so really trying to understand, and then of course in the aftermath of Uvalde. So the, the idea here is to spend money to, to do that. I did hear from Dr. Battle. Um, I, I, I may withdraw this, I'm not sure. I just re received some information on Tuesday, but Chair, I guess if I'll do that, I'll do it through the council office. But I do think that there's merit in making sure we are looking at this as a body and we may not do it through the budget process. I okay, because so. I know there is there's a resolution coming through. That's correct. Trying yeah. to make some other stuff happen, yep. so that might be another area. Um, okay, and then Bernardi Cock has also supported the co-response task force. Councilmember Suara. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that uh, to Councilmember Benedict's uh, 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 safety issue that there's some other things that have been talked about, including cameras and things like that. I would support us looking at additional safety for our schools in light of everything that is happening but I'm not in support of having additional SROs in schools. There was a piece on WPLN about that tonight. I can't remember the name of the thing. But can I, thank can you I for that cl clarification. clarify for the record? Yes, that, you may. That is absolutely not the intent of this. There are, there are, there is no intent in expanding our SROs or any armed officers and certainly not in our elementary schools. This is purposefully to say, how should we be handling security and safety at our schools it may actually reduce the number of SROs. We'll just have to see. That's the goal of the study is to determine what should we have that will keep everybody safe in our facilities. Okay, Council Member Pulley. Just very briefly, uh, I reached out to the police department and the uh, school uh, MNPS 
as well after both of these incidents just to uh, make sure they knew they had my support and to inquire about uh, what their situation is. I'm not comfortable discussing uh, school security publicly because I think that uh, uh, is problematic if we give specific details of that. But uh, uh, I, I'm certainly comfortable that they are on this. They have been uh, uh, looking at this for a while. Uh, this is not new to them what's happening and there are a lot of specific things they're involved in and uh, and I'm comfortable with uh, I'm more comfortable with the professionals doing this and I'm a little concerned about us getting over our, out over our skis uh, uh, really pushing a study that may not be necessary uh, or may not be of any value to them whatsoever so I think it's really important that we work in conjunction with uh, the professionals at MNPS and MPD as we walk through this journey. I think it's very appropriate that we keep an eye on it and make sure it's done well and professionally. That'd Thank you. Councilmember Bendick, did you? I just, so that is the feedback that I received earlier this week and that I definitely am considering as it relates to potentially reaching out to the council office to say, keep it in, take it out for you. Based on what you hear from MNPS. Based on what okay. I've heard from MNPS and, and MNPD. I've been in touch with both. Great. And, yep. Thank okay. you. I think we we're going to go. Okay, I think that's it for police. Anything else on police? Move on to Department 32, Fire Department, and EMS services. Um, I believe this is the same. Two co-response, two FTEs. Is that the same? It is. Okay, two, for, two from each department. Yes. Great. Um, okay. Next is um, item 52, Community Oversight Board. Um, this is support positions. This is mine of legal and executive assistant, 161,800. And I will confess that I've been so busy trying to fill the, the, the school budget. I do not have a funding source, um, but I will not take it from things that people have already said they don't like. Um, I'll try to fill that gap in before Monday. I, I will say that um, if you read the, the questionnaires that the different departments sent in, um, a very good case was made for having, um, actually they asked for about nine or 11 more positions and Mr. Hayes was here earlier, I think, is here to advocate for that. Um, because we, you know, we don't have an infinite amount of money, I don't know that we can fill all of them, but I did, I did feel like she made a really good case for having uh, the legal assistant and the executive assistant would make that committee able to, to do its job more effectively and would um, request consideration of that. Council Member Suara. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to speak to you that that is on my request and I'm actually adding three positions in addition to the social worker legal assistant. I'm asking the public information coordinator as well. Uh, and for any of you that listen to my budget conversation, it's just that when the, the COB is more than just investigating whatever happened with the police, it's also providing assistance to the people that come in and have to deal with the trauma and their families. So that's why these positions are necessary. And in terms of the funding source, uh, it's coming out of the police uh, recruitment bonus. I wanted to speak to that since uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Pulley said something about that. That 1,000 bonus is actually not part of the police department budget. This 1,000 recruitment bonus, if you look at the um, uh, the ordinance is coming out of administration is on page two of that with, with all the benefits and everything and there's a thousand dollars just sitting there after benefit that says police recruitment bonus. So this is not coming from the police budget. This is from administration budget and also if you listen to what the chief said in terms of everybody wanting to come here. It's not in their budget. So this is not taking it from the police budget, but I do think taking that money and putting it in COB and put it in uh, homelessness. I think it's a uh, well used money. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then Council Member Mendez, you had five FTEs. You want to speak to that? Sure. Um, the reasoning is the same that the UN Council Member Suara articulated. Um, they asked for a total of nine. I think they were uh, had at four new positions in the mayor's proposed budget. And um, I think uh, in order to, to get them up to full speed as a department um, after the voters, I think. 60, 65% voted in favor of it. I think we should um, go ahead and and um, get them um, to the number of positions that they need. Um, and I, I did um, I did uh, list the source as the police department. The cost is four hundred thirty nine thousand dollars. And um, like um, my friend Councilmember Pulley mentioned, I, I respect that there's more than one view in the room on this. Um, and but. I'll make the pitch because now's the time to make the pitch. Um, uh, the first budget that I worked on um, in fiscal 17, so June of 2016, 
um, the police department budget was 181 million. Um, by the time um, we got uh, two years later to FY19, it was just shy of 200 million at 199. Um, and change. And I think uh, this year is slated to be 244 million. So from FY17 to 23, I guess, um, we're looking at a, something like a, a third increase, 60, 60 plus million dollar increase. And I don't know the exact number this year, but it's 20 ish uh, of an increase this year. Um, this amount of money that we're talking about for all the positions, um, the $439,000 comes down to something like two tenths of a percent of the proposed budget um, from the mayor's office. Um, and just, just the way that uh, uh, you, Ms. Flannery, were able to find, you know, seven, $8 million um, um, from odds and ends um, on roughly a billion dollars worth of spending on something that is pushing a quarter of a billion, um, finding $439,000 to get the COB fully funded. It's, uh, there's nothing resembling uh, quote unquote defunding about that um, in an era where we've seen the police department during um, my time in the council um, budget grow by $60 million. Um, I would also add, um, I, I've been the chief proponent of the argument that department after department has been underfunded um, during a lot of the time that I've been in office. And so the fact that it's grown, I, I'm not complaining about that, um, but it is uh, the, the growth. I think if you, if you look department by department, the growth in the police department budget has far outstripped um, maybe most everything except for perhaps the mayor's office budget. Um, but other departments, uh, this growth is outstripped. I understand there's um, different perspectives in, in the room, but this is, and I, I don't mean to pick a fight about it, um, this is the opportunity to make the pitch. That's the pitch. That's the pitch. Thank you very much. Anything else on, on that? Uh, next is uh, 33 Codes Administration. We've already talked about this co-response task force. Uh, so we'll move on to 37 Social Services. Um, the first item is both the Minority Caucus, Councilmember Porterfield and Councilmember Suara, which is a motel for social services. Um, and maybe the, the funding sources are different, but um, I'll start with my vice chair and then move to Councilmember Stiles. Um, thank you. And so during the uh, budget hearing, um, we find out that social services budget has been going down for some time. I reach out to uh, Director Pratt and I ask what are their basic needs now. She said sometimes when they have homeless people in the streets and need a place to put them, they usually put them in motels and that fund is really going very fast. And I ask how much would she need if, she, if we can give any additional funds. She said about 50,000 will be, will be okay. So um, that's why I think that for them to be able to have places to put people until so we're working on the homeless division and we're building homes, all that is good, but there's an immediate need that needs to be addressed. And for 50,000, I think that's very reasonable. Uh, the source of funding, again, I took 300, uh, how much did I take? From the 1 million from uh, the police, I took uh, 300,000. That's where the 250 for COB came and the 50,000 for this, I think it's, uh, uh, that's where we, we want it. And then for the minority caucus, the same thing. Same thing. Uh, 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 using all that funding sources that Councilmember Toombs listed before. Okay. And then Councilmember Porterfield is not here, so we don't know what her funding source is. Councilmember Toombs. So when the Minority Caucus did it list, we ranked things top 10 and we put this as number one. Um, generally speaking, Nashville General is the number one priority for the Minority Caucus, but we put this number one um, because of the homelessness crisis that we have in the city going on, as well as the state law that's going to go into effect right. in about a month. That's going to uh, make it a felony to sleep in uh, pub on public property. So it's uh, very important that we, you know, uh, give social services the, the funding that they need so they can get people off the streets as quickly as possible. Good point. Great. Uh, thank you. Anything else on, on that one? So next is uh, Councilmember Sepulveda money for MC3 Nashville Music City Construction Careers to create pathways to middle class building trades for Nashville residents with an emphasis on serving women, communities of color, transitioning veterans and other populations historically underserved by the workforce development. Uh, that was $50,000 to be taken from the 4% fund. Um, I'm thinking that's not actually appropriate for the 4% fund. Is that correct? So that needs a different funding source. We will council member styles. It's kind of a sidebar. So 
um, for the codes administration and fire. So minority caucus had the same request. Just wanted to be sure that was on the record for the co-response task yes. force. It's mine and minority caucus. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Thank I'm, you. I breezed past it because I'm trying to get to the other eight pages and we've talked no about worries. that one. But but duly noted, it has been multiply, um, which which speaks to its uh, its support. So thank you for that. Councilmember Toombs. Really quickly, Chair, the MC3 program is also on the Minority Caucus list and it's included in the bucket of funding sources. Okay. So Minority Bucket is the funding source. Okay. Great. We'll look at that. Uh, and then finally, Councilmember Welsh. I'm sorry, anything else? Councilmember Welsh uh, to create an office, Department of Homeless Services, $3.364 million. Um, and I guess if I can just... I'll let council member Welsh speak to it, and then I may have a question or you may answer my question. So go for it. Um, this is basically taking the funding that would go towards the Homeless Impact Division. Um, I think it's really important that we get this um, independent office up and running as soon as possible um, so that we can actually more strategically address the issue of homelessness, which is, as we all know, getting worse. Um, while I see some of the wisdom of providing more money to do ho motels, that is very expensive and it's very unsustainable, and we really need to be finding permanent housing for people more quickly. So I think that um, the sooner that we can get an independent office up and running and funded and get experts on the ground with a real strategic approach and a systematic approach to um, addressing the homelessness issue, I think we'll see uh, better and more positive outcomes more quickly. So I think we just need to jumpstart that office the minute it passes council. Gotcha. Okay. And I guess if I can get somebody behind me to come in, if, um, if that money is currently in social services, but we pull those people from social services and put them in this new um, division, will, the money will just follow them. Is that probably how it will work? Yeah, I wasn't here, so I'm going to speak about something I'm not informed on, but I think it would be similar to the creation of NDOT um, from general services, the same kind of... Gotcha. Um, so that may... Do we, do we therefore need to move the money officially in the budget, or is, can we leave it in social services knowing that it will follow that department when it gets formed? I would like to run it by law, but I would think an MOU could satisfy that ah, something MOU. internally. But okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that may that may be that may be formalized by the MOU, and then we can leave that. Okay. Next is um, yes, I'm Councilor sorry, Gamble. Before we move on, can we hear from the mayor's office about? plans uh, that the mayor has identified $50 million in ARP money for homelessness. Can we get an idea of what the plan is for that money? Would it be for to start an office of homelessness or anything like that? Good question. Ms. Wilson. Um, first of all, I should add that I believe the um, COVID Financial Oversight Committee meeting is uh, next Wednesday, and the intent is for there to be a review of the plans, both for the $30 million proposed for affordable housing, as well as the $50 million in proposed to homelessness. So I don't want to steal the thunder in that. But what I will say on the Office of Homelessness is, no, there's not funding in that. That's a programmatic use. So it's uh, primarily around permanent supportive housing, I think around $25 million, um, and then services essentially associated with supporting permanent supportive housing and or engaging uh, the service providers in our community. Many of them are very good. But as we transition kind of their focus more towards chronic homelessness, which we identified um, through expert consultants needs to be more of a focus. Those same expert consultants recommended the creation of the Office of Homelessness, but I want to be clear that, you know, there are two things to take into account on this. One, their recommendation was to take six to nine months to do so because we want to be careful about not creating a silo only around homelessness. There will still need to be a pretty important relationship with social services because their caseworkers are the ones, for example, that interact with and staff the uh, emergency cold weather shelter. So there's a number of relationships that need to be worked out. Um, so not to rush that. And then secondly, we have a search underway uh, for a new director of the division, which will become the new director. And um, uh, uh, it, it, I would just recommend that in some ways we, we move to have that person come in um, and help create that new office uh, uh, as well. But I recommend, I recognize that other people may have feelings about timing for that and may not be looking to take the expert's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so on 244 Human Relations Commission, this is uh, Councilmember Welsh. You have two items here. 
Um, yes, thank you, Chair. This is um, another piece in bringing Metro up to full Title VI compliance. Um, this would establish um, a full-time Title VI compliance officer and a part-time admin under the um, auspices of the Metro Human Relations Commission, as well as a full-time professional training manager and specialist. Um, and if we decide that we don't want to fund all of these positions at once, we could um, fund the training position at a later date because we could absorb some of those. But basically, there are a lot of requirements for Title VI under federal law that we are not necessarily always meeting in terms of annual trainings and reporting, data tracking, um, all sorts of things. And this, um, this new compliance officer would deal with the person in each department who is tasked at this point with making sure that there is Title VI compliance, uh, many of whom don't feel like they have the skill or the expertise or have the training to actually do that effectively or know what that is they're supposed to be uh, data gathering um, and work with with all of those department um, specific personnel to make sure we're actually doing what we need to do for our reporting. Um, every department that receives any federal money is required to uh, fulfill Title VI requirements for the federal government. And right now with ARP funds, that means all departments within Metro. This also includes things like making sure its department has documents that are translated into different languages so people can access um, any customer facing services within Metro and understand what they're doing and do things and access the government and get those services easily. So this compliance officer and this administrative support personnel would make sure that is happening in each department and fill in any gaps and make sure that um, we are in full compliance with federal law. And the funding source for the compliance officer and the admin would come from the additional monies right now allocated to the Chamber of Commerce and the full-time training professional I would pull from MNPD. Okay, so I see 125,000 from the Chamber in addition to the 75,000, which is 200,000, which is more than we're given them. No, the other one was 50,000. 50,000. Okay. One, 125 and 50,000, so that's the 175. That the 91,000 for the additional full-time position for the training manager would come from M MNPD. Okay. The compliance officer would be $91,000 with fringe and the part-time admin would be the balance of that 125. Okay. Um, I guess I'm looking back on Metro Council, the translation services in the Spanish M&N &M was 50 and 75. So, so the 50 is what you would pull from the chamber and the 75 would come from somewhere else for the translation services. Um, well, my understanding was we already have 25,000. Okay. My understanding is we already have $25,000 in the council budget. Ah. This would be an additional 50000 on top of that that would cover those the okay. television network and things. So you're not asking for seventy five and fifty. dollars Correct. Correct. 75 Correct. is yep. 25. Okay, good. Good to clarify. Thank you. Um, and I, I did find the information on the chamber that I had. It's long and I'm not going to read it, but I will, I will send it uh, to council members just to provide information on, on what, they, what they do for that. Thank you for that. Any other comments on Human Relations Committee? Next is the Hospital Authority. Um, I have Council Member Porterfield is the first name that I see, but I'm not sure if she goes with these first ones to keep oncology and the 5% pay raise for $2 million. Does anyone own that one? Council Member Toombs. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. So when um, Bruce Nearmore, the CFO for Nashville General, gave his um, budget presentation, uh, he mentioned that there is about a $2 million budget gap um, they were able to whittle it down by to $2 million by cutting certain things out of their budget. And one of the things they cut was the COLA to their employees. Their employees would get a 3% COLA. Um, and, and that's how they're, they are getting down to that $2 million gap. Um, if we don't give them the additional $2 million, he also mentioned that one of the things they were looking at cutting was their oncology services. Um, if they were to go back up to the 5% COLA, then they, they would be looking at a gap of a little over $3 million. And that's from an email that I received from Mr. Nairmore okay. today. So both of those together then would be $3 million. Yes. Okay. And is there a funding source? The, it's in the bucket because this is also in the bucket. on the Minority Caucus This is caucus Minority list. Caucus. Okay. Yes. That's who it is. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. And then food pharmacy. That's just part of that as well. I'm a fan of the food pharmacy, so I, I appreciate having that one in there. Anything else? Um, okay, question about the, the low cap payments for Bordeaux and Knowles. Can we just get someone to explain when we, when we 
remove that from Metro Hospital, we still left them with a payment on that? Is that, is that still in place? That, that payment is actually, the majority of that payment is related to the pension uh, payments for the employees who have retired and are, that's why it's called a legacy there. They're ah. still retired, still need, still require payment for their retired benefits. So that's what the majority of that low cap is for. So. And those are Metro General employees who were at Bordeaux when they were in charge and of that? And Knowles. Knowles was actually Knowles. transferred okay. to, to Bordeaux at one point. I mean, uh, to General at one point also. Okay. So it is still there. Okay. We can't move it. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's any other comments on National General Hospital? Okay, next is um, uh, Department 38 Health, and there are um, is a request for the HEALS crisis response team. And I would love for someone from the administration to verify. I mean, I, my understanding is that the technical grant that we got is now uh, working with a, a task group to go through the logistics of what it would take to get that started and that there is funding to begin that in January. Can you verify that and tell me where that funding is in the budget. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. No, no problem. And uh, uh, I, if, if I've needed, I'll confirm with some dollar amounts too. But um, yes, that task force is already underway. Um, it is through SAMHSA, the Gaines Learning Center. So we have national expertise on the ground that are actually helping us with two projects. One is the non-law enforcement model. And the second is around me uh, mental well-being and competency in our court system. The, the court system piece is over in general sessions and that um, uh, likely will have two aspects. It will have um, both employee um, support as well as a, a contract with our, our state designated provider mental health cooperative. Um, there is also funding in place in both the health department and also over in the fire department for us to support the non-law enforcement model. And uh, two of the probably most primary players for you all to get updates from as you'd like um, on the non-law enforcement uh, work as it's progressing, our, our DEC department head, Steve Martini, who's right. heavily engaged in uh, this work and is plays a very critical role in the um, determination of a non-emergency versus an emergency need. Um, so Steve Martini and then Chief Brooke Haas uh, from EMS in, in the Nashville Fire Department. Those two are really kind of the um, on the ground co-designers working with those uh, SAMHSA Gaines Learning Center uh, uh, efforts. Okay, if, if you can show me where in those two budgets that that because I know it, it probably will involve a van that we might not have yet and and several people beginning in January and I just uh, want to I want to be yeah. able to assure people it's really yep. there because I keep saying that and let I want to make sure I'm not a liar. Let me follow up with an email for you if That'd that helps with an illustration. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. And and I'm going to request again. Can we call it heels, please? I'm not in charge of the okay. branding. I don't know. I'm just going on <laughs> record repeatedly. I, would, I, will, I will make sure that that request is respectfully brought okay. to that working group. Okay. I mean, I know the key piece is is, no, is not uniforms and, and, and just pulling it out of that. So thank you for that. Any other comments on the heels? Okay, uh, next is full-time animal special and pet foster coordinator from council member Bradford. I don't, I think this is the same thing with several choices. It's $96,000 to either come from the chamber or the Greenway parks or the Dell payment. Comments or questions on that one? We've talked about the back end of those. Um, next is council member Hurt. Uh, and the Minority Caucus are both asking for $100,000 for the public safety grant. Can anyone speak to that? I think I have it. On the public safety grant from the Minority Caucus? Yes, I'll, I'll speak to that, Chair, if it's okay. Great. Uh, that is something uh, that was submitted uh, from one of the caucus members to address uh, gun violence and reduction of gun violence. The money is being proposed to provide grants to small community organizations, similar to the work that we're doing on the Community Safety Partnership Fund uh, to, to help reduce um, violence and gun violence in the community. So that's what that is. I'm all for that. Okay, great. Thank you for speaking on that. 
and and council member hurt was sorry she couldn't be here but she feels really strongly about that so hey I, i'm may i be recognized yes i'm sorry i just wanted to ask a question since it is similar to what we're already doing is it just to add a new part of town or uh, no because we're doing napier and sudicum now and then next right. to south right it wasn't for a specific area of town um as it was explained to me um so it's overall but it, it would be similar to the um opportunity grants that we that we did in the first round of support from the community safety partnership fund where we worked with small organizations mm -hmm. and and giving them grants to support the work that they're already doing in the community to help reduce violence whether it's mentoring food programs of uh, programs that address the root causes of violence and things like that so this from what i understand this would be a similar uh grant program that we're kind of doing yeah okay thanks and council member Swara. I just wanted to add that I do have a text from Councilmember Hurt, and also in our budget conversation on non-alternative uh, to policing, uh, and we were talking about the program at Sudicum, one of the things that one of the partners that is part of the program talks about is that oftentimes we look at big organizations to do some of this work, but there's a lot of mom and pop, really small organization on the ground that are working on this. And so what Councilmember Hurt is saying is that we have a framework and it's a good one, but we do need more and we need this small organization right now to add to that work so that we get to every nooks and corners and, and make it as effective as possible. Gotcha. So that was our explanation. Okay, thank you for that. And and you may have said this, Council Member Evans, but I mean we just we just awarded close to two million dollars, I think, or our or our second million dollar for ten different organizations, I think, or a lot. Is that is that different from this or Y yes, actually, it was about eight hundred and twenty-eight million, okay. but that's specifically for the Napier. Oh, I'm sorry, thousand. thousand. Yeah, but that's specifically for the uh, Napier Sudicum community. Okay, so this would be a geographically different right. area. Okay, more areas. Thank you for that clarification. Any other comments on that one? And that comes out of the bucket. Uh, next is uh, Department Thirty Nine Public Library. Um, um, one hundred and ten additional slots for NASA is one hundred and seventy-three dollars. I'm not sure who's that is, but I'm I'm a fan of NASA. Uh, security staffing, one more person for fifty-seven thousand. Parking for downtown libraries. My understanding is that something is being worked out with the um, shuttle service. Council member, yeah, council member, Ms. Wilson, will you? You can you can say that faster I'll than I can find the email. I'll call that a promotion too. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, and, and you know, please know we're always going to partner and work on these where we can. Um, the uh, I really need to give credit to General Services, to Velvet Hunter, to NDOT, Diana Alarcon, to the Nashville Downtown Partnership. They've been working with the libraries, and the reality is, is the parking garage itself. It does not have enough spaces in it right now available for additional um, cards. But what they've worked out is is actually a dedicated shuttle at certain hours that would go specifically to a location proximate on the corner there for the library and for their employees. And for us to run that um, five days a week would be about $110,000. So they would have um, a dedicated uh, a shuttle. And that number could come down because the federal courthouse next door may be interested in sharing it too with their employees as well. Um, so that's that's one piece of it. And then the weekend component of it right now would be looking at the garage, but we're mm -hmm. going to talk with the parking garage operator because we, we have some utilization opportunities probably with the cards and the spaces we already have. So right now that 300 and some thousand dollar number has come down to about 160 k is a safe number to put in and that number may we're going to continue to work it may even come down a little bit more if we can either cost share with the federal courthouse or if we have the opportunity to um, work out the weekend piece with the parking operator further great thank you for that that update we appreciate and, the and my understanding is the library staff are happy with that based on okay i shared some emails with you Appreciate that. Um, votes for women staffing, $69,300 extended hours for the downtown library. I don't see a name associated with those five or, or a funding source. Does anyone have any comments on that? Vice Chair? Um, yes. the, the library was uh, one of mine, and I believe that the funding source was the uh, 
technology. Now, I'm confused with all this thing that I have in front of me, but there is a technology review uh, also in administration for a million, uh, uh, and I'm taking that uh, 300 now, 160K uh, from that for the parking. Gotcha. Uh, and I had had conversations with uh, Ms. Wilson about that one because I was I was going to rate it as well. Um, <laughs> and her her comment is is the the goal of that is to save us a whole lot more money in the future by looking for synergies between, for example, our IT and JIS and MNPS and all the different ITs that we have together. Um, so that that may be money that will save us money down the line. But um, it I just it's I want to throw that out. It's now, so we can still save with the with the balance. Gotcha. Fair enough. Okay, uh, Councilmember Benedict, Library Park, and we've talked about Councilmember Cash had to had to leave. Um, he also has asked for a, a ten dock bicycle station that can come from the four percent fund, and we could just wait and do that at four percent fund time as another option. I think we've talked about everything on that list. Um, staff and employee parking, we talked about. So next on to um, Metro Action Commission, Councilmember. Uh, Hurt had a workforce development grant, and again, she had texted me and um, asked that we give that serious consideration. She is, as as you know, that is a cause she um, spends an awful lot of time on, and that would come out of the minority. Councilmember Timmons, you want to talk about that one? You're, I think you were about to say what I was going to say, that that is on the minority caucuses okay. list and okay. will be in the bucket. Gotcha. Great. Councilmember Gamble. Yes, I, I'd like to speak to that, if that's okay. Uh, Councilmember Hurt. Uh, stated that there, this program exists in MAC today. It was initially funded by Mayor Barry, but hasn't been funded over the last few years. It's a workforce development uh, program where they offer trainings and, and other services to help, um, help individuals get skills to get jobs. And so she's asking that the funding be restored, uh, or we're asking that the funding be restored for that program at $100,000. Okay, restored. Great, thank you. Anything else on that one? Councilmember Stiles, uh, restorative therapist, home-based daycare providers from the Thank bucket. you. Thank you very much, Chair. So uh, over the course of the year, the Women's Caucus has been discussing um, making sure that we're focused on helping women and children across the board uh, with legislation and actions. And so this year we've been speaking with several home-based care providers and center-based care providers for daycare. And one of the needs that came out was a restorative therapist. Many of these uh, providers are helping the very community suffering with issues that they have themselves and they do not have an outlet. So with these two positions, they would have someone they would be able to schedule appointments with and they would be within MAC and Ms. Kroom has already agreed to oh, have oversight over these individuals. So this would be a great opportunity for the city to really pour directly into child care services, which has not been done before. Good. And that's that's a huge thing we've been talking about. Um, under one of these items, it has the funding source would be water development services. That's incorrect. Okay, good. Because there's the, two, it's, it's multiple from the bucket. Yeah. Okay, great. Anything else on on that? Thank you for your work on that. Next is yeah, well, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Just thank you, know. you chair. It, it, uh, this inadvertently got left off the minority caucus list, but this is something we discussed it in our meeting yesterday, and it is something that we support. And with the decrease in amount for the employee parking for a library, we can technically slide this one in. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good job. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, okay, good. All right, we solved that one. Next is uh, Parks and Greenways. Councilmember Johnston had asked for Community Resource Center and Hands on Nashville. She knew she wouldn't be able to be here, but asked if um, if I can just read briefly from um, from her email. I'm advocating for $100,000 advocation allocation for Hands on Nashville and Community Resource Center. This small allocation is huge support for these organizations that do so much for our community. They have an MOU with the city and are both expected at a moment's notice to be at the ready on site whenever disaster strikes. Metro has never supported these organizations financially in 2021 and 2020. Uh, the CRC responded to all declared disasters in Davidson County, as well as the pandemic and a few other weather related incidences were not declared. They must be prepared at any time and they provide a plethora of services and relief to our community of, of and then she gives a list of ways that they help disaster preparedness. They cover training costs, they develop uh, the standard operating procedures and exercises and 
um, volunteer leader programs. So that is a, um, a heartfelt plea, which I'm happy to print and send out to people for supporting those two. Um, and Council Member Swope. Thank you. And, and, and I will absolutely ditto what okay. uh, Council Lady Johnson just set, sent in and you read. Um, the CRC and Hands on Nashville, uh, through, through every disaster we've had in the last four years, which has been quite a lot of them, um, I have run truckloads of stuff on, on their behalf to all people all over the city, um, and we do not fund them at all, which I think is incorrect. I wouldn't take it from planning, though. I would make that pull from OEM and or mm -hmm. FIRE because they support those two organizations and work hand in hand with them, especially when disaster hits. Okay. Thank you. Good suggestion. Councilor Sora. Uh, and I just want to add that it's not even just disaster. Uh, I know that when we did the John Lewis Way event last year, Hands on Nashville was very much there. And with the Afghan refugees that, are, that came in recently, uh, the, uh, the Community Resource Center has been very, I mean, critical in getting things to people. So I'm very much in support of those two organizations as well. Great. Thank you. Ms. Wilson? I, I just wanted to add, these are great organizations and they are great partners. But we, I just want to clarify two things. One, the, the VOAD model that we have around our emergencies through OEM, we fundraise in a particular designated provider in order to make sure that the costs are covered for the other providers. And then number two is, is that we use fee, we do FEMA reimburse, we, they're part of our FEMA reimbursements we seek. And so we, we do bring money to them. I just, I didn't want to, you all to think that we, we leave our partners hanging. There is, there is now, again, they're great organizations and they do so much. And if it's not declared a disaster by the governor, for example, just like we lose out, they lose out too, unless it's donations based, right, in our community. But I, I, I want, I just wanted you guys to know we're not, we're uh, for the record, we don't, we don't leave our partners hanging out there. <laughs> that's no, all, no, that's it, all I wanted to it, say. It, th thank you for adding that because it, it, that's important for the public to know as well too. Good, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, council member, uh, I'm going to skip council member Lee's because it doesn't have an amount anywhere. So on to uh, 64 Sports Authority. This is a study of the Nitton, Nissan Stadium obligations. Council member Parker. Thank you. Um, so as, as some of y'all might know, in, in 2017, we did a study um, of what it would cost to keep the Nissan Stadium facility uh, in, in good condition. Uh, you know, that study determined it would be about $300 million over 20 years, so about $15 million a year. Um, the estimates that we've heard since then are, are considerably higher, um, some as high as sixfold higher. Um, so what, what, we're, what I'm hoping to do here is um, allocate $200,000, which is, I believe, one eleven thousandth of the higher end estimates that we're hearing um, to sort of get a metro side opinion about what our obligations are under the existing lease. Um, so that's, that's what we're hoping to do here, just sort of a, 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 a bare bones level of, of due diligence. And um, we think that Sports Authority is the appropriate place for it. That could possibly change. Um, and there may also be an ordinance required in order to get this to actually take place. But um, I do think it's important to go ahead and set the money aside someplace in the budget process. Gotcha. And Director Kelly, can you speak to it as, as this is a one-time thing? Does that sort of get any kind of special status? Yeah, I was prepared to say no, but it is very much one time and would kind of fall in that, that, that bucket okay. that we've been circling at eight would be 8.2 if you were to move forward on this one. Okay, so you're legit on the pulling from the fund balance. I, I, <laughs> my, my other one I know we'll, we'll probably have to talk about, but, but thank you, Director. That's great. Uh, Okay, next, great. Any other comments on that one? Next is uh, MTA. And by the way, yeah, it, I may stand up and walk out quickly and Council Member Soar will take over because I've got to catch a plane in, in a short amount of time. Um, we go public transit federal funds offset $10 million taken from in MNPD. This is Council Member O'Connell. Does anyone else want to explain what he's proposing here? <laughs> there you go. All right, we'll move on. Okay, public works, general fund functions. Um, Eric was here. Eric, can you can you tell us a little bit what what that is? Have a mic right there. Thank you very much, Eric Byer with WeGo Public Transit. I believe um, Councilmember O'Connor's intent 
is um, historically WeGo has had to use its federal capital funds to make its operating budget whole. And so we have leveraged those funds in order to um, continue with our operations. So um, my understanding is that Council Member O'Connell would like to keep us on the better bus plan and work towards fulfilling the transportation plan adoption and progressing that. So uh, not being reliant on those federal funds to fill the operating dollars, but to progress the plan and move that forward with that amount and use um, operating dollars or operating and capital for capital. Gotcha. Thank you. Any, any questions or comments? Glad, glad you're here. That's, that's a big one not to know what's going on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, 42 Public Works, now known as NDOT. Um, we had repeated requests for $3,000 for each district for beautification projects from a number of different council members, uh, and that would be funded either by self-insured liability. So that would come under that same question of do we have any left before the actuarial people come after us, um, or uh, the right-of-way litter collection, council member Hancock. Um, so I was one of the four people that suggested this. We had a um, contingency of the beautification commissioners that approached many council members asking us to make a request. They all asked for $100,000, but 3,000 times 35 is 105. So um, Cash and I apparently both did that math. And um, I agree that they need a budget. We always talk about council members not having staff. If we have any staff member, it is our beautification commissioner and they're a volunteer staff member. And they're not, not asking for $3,000 for funds for themselves. They're asking for it to buy soil or mulch or bulbs or trees, you know, things that they can use to help beautify the district. When beautification commissioners were first created, they were created under parks. We moved them to public works, but we didn't have any legislation that we can find yet that shows that. And then now they've been moved to NDOT. They have a kind of sour taste in their mouth. They feel like they're NDOT and that they're not trash people. They do litter pickups because they're trying to beautify the area. But but that's not the only thing they do. I think we all have problems with litter, so I don't really want to reduce the litter budget. That's why I chose the mayor's office, because I think while I love the mayor's office and have been super supportive of council over the years, I do think they also have that challenge where sometimes they have staff members leave and then it takes them a few months to fill those positions. So I think that they wouldn't miss this little bit of amount of money that the beautification commissioners are begging for. And then we can do proper legislation legislation to officially move them to NDOT. And I think they'll all be super happy if we can just do this for every single one of you and every single one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other comments? And Mr. Jameson, can I ask if if some of these were to use this for tree planting, could, could some of this come from the tree planting fund in some way? Come to the mic. Can you come to the mic? I'm sorry. The tree planting fund is, I, I think, particularly, I don't want to curse this, but it's particularly flush under the budget with 1.5 million coming in. So I don't know that they're uh, particularly in, in need, but um, that is an option if you want that funded in that account. Okay. <laughs> Our choice. Okay. I, I just, I mean, I know in some neighborhoods, tree planting would be something and it would be great to have neighborhoods working with y'all if there's, if there's a way to take advantage of the fact that we've set side money aside and I don't, I don't know that I want to diminish either of those efforts, but if there's a synergy there and we can recognize it and, and that's appropriate, I'm just wondering how to do that. No, that's, that's a possibility. I just, I don't know that, that you're, you're going to find that a strong need this year in, in, the, in the tree planting fund. Because again, you'll recall uh, last year the council set aside the equivalent of the 1% for the arts to the 1% for the trees that is now implemented. Uh, I think the Cumberland River Compact will be coming before the council next year for the actual or next month for the actual grant allocation of those funds. So um, I think we're for the first time in a long time in a pretty healthy place with respect to, to do that. the so, 50,000 trees by 2050 or 500,000 trees by great. 2050. So we can encourage our beautification commissioners to also apply for grants on top of that. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Council, council just a, quick, Gamble. just a quick note to add to that. I appreciate Council Member Hancock for bringing this forward. There are grants available, but they're limited. When I was a beautification commissioner, I got a grant of $1,500 to put up no, don't litter signs in the district. But so I don't want to make it seem like it's just limited to tree uh, planting because 
signage. Um, there's an effort to get a mural in my district. So it could pay for things like that. So this is very important. For Great. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, there was a long, long list that was included in that request and we put it in the spreadsheet, but you know, the printed version only shows you so much, but thank you. And thank you for your service as a beautification commissioner and council right. on Gamble. Council on Gamble. Any of yeah. that way. Great. Chair, sure. if I could just, just really quickly yes. echo, like, I mean, the, the, my beautification commissioner contacted me about this and I mean, the, what, what our beautification commissioners get done with, with no funding is, is really amazing. And I think that just giving them just a little bit of support, a um, little bit of money to work with would be really great. And, you know, they're already going out of the way using their own vehicles and stuff for a lot of stuff, but wearing tire on their cars, paying for gasoline and all that. So if we can do a little bit to support them and give them some flexibility, I'd, I'd, I'd support that. Great. So thank you. Great, great, great. Um, all right, MNPS, lots of stuff here. Uh, 22,000 for BEP reduction. We've talked about that already. Um, and so far we haven't rated those sources too much. So I think that is possibly still there. Um, there is a 29,000 to support staff living wage. I'm not sure where the 29 came from. I'm sorry, 29 million. Um, does somebody own that number? Because I, I know 9 million is one we've talked about a lot. 6.5 million for MNPS 5% COLA. Um, let's see. Uh, I had thrown some in here just to make sure they got talked about, but I think other people have also taken them up. So I'll, I will let other members talk about the funding sources that they've come up with. So um, I'm gonna go down to one additional paid day off for 10 month employees by Bradford. He's not here. That would come from the Greenway Park. Council member Evans, do you wanna talk about yours? Yes, it actually should be under health and um, it's it, we're going to go a different path. So okay. I won't need it considered at all. Okay, so actually scratch that one. Great. Um, all right. Then we had, um, is that Gamble MNPS support staff? You, okay, you, you've owned the $9 million. You want to talk about that? Yes, and, and this was added to my list after the public hearing the other night and hearing from the support staff. I, it's, it's, it's critical that we get the support staff at MMPS up to a living wage here in Nashville. It, it's, it's a sad situation. Some of the things that they're having to contend with at working, and, and these are dedicated workers uh, for our school system. So I'm proposing that we find the $9 million to get them up to a, the, the support staff up to a living wage. I initially proposed that it come out of the 4% fund, but after hearing from Director Flannery, um, maybe there's probably a better source, general fund, I'm, I'm not sure where, but whatever we can do to find that, I, I, I support that and encourage that we do. Vice Chair. Thank you, um, and I'm just, I know everybody at this table has heard the argument and talk about it, but for the sake of the, for those who do not and, and the listening audience, uh, right now we have a lot of people uh, in our support, support staff that are making $24,000, which is horrendous. Uh, considering the cost of living in Nashville, it's just, I, I, I don't even know how a family lives on $24,000. And so where the $9 million comes from is that there is a calculation by ACIU, the, the union that supports support staff, that went back and looked at all the people that are making $24,000, with the exception of the bus drivers and nutrition, uh, nutrition staff, because MMPS is already budgeted the bus drivers and nutrition staff. So everybody that is not in that category that makes 24,000. This is to bring up their salary to 33,000. And the 33,000 is based on an MIT study that says that that's what the cost of living, which is still ridiculous, is supposed to be, but that's what that 9 million is doing. And so uh, I think for the people that are, again, everybody said it at the meeting, that are doing so much for us, for our students in the classroom, making them up to $33,000 should not be something that we spend too much time on. And I hope we can find the money to do that. God. And, and Ms. Hall, since you're here, can you just in a general HR question say, if we, if we find $9 million and we give it to the MNPS school board, um, does that require another pay study to be done to come up with another chart or or is there a way that they can actually use that so just a reminder i will definitely offer my professional input but metro we have no jurisdiction over schools pay we have no jurisdiction no study etc um i think i think one of the biggest questions and i would just give this as an overarching comment 
there is a reason why um, I, I do think it has to be contemplated as part of the greater compensation structure for MNPS. So just giving a lump of money and getting people up to a particular rate of pay has implications. You'll hear the term, we talk about it sometimes with you all on our side, compression issues, mm -hmm. right? So simply lifting everybody up to a particular um, pay rate um, has implications for the people that they possibly report to and kind of so on down the line. And that's something that we keep a really careful mind of because it can cause inequities not only within a reporting structure, but even among divisions, depending on where that money is located. The other um, kind of unique challenge that is a little different for schools is that some of these positions um, are not on a scheduled eight hour workday. Some of these have reduced hours. I think um, that should also be studied. You know, is it appropriate? Maybe some of these should be up to eight hours. Maybe some of these still need to be at the reduced hours. Um, I agree. I have two children in public schools, national public schools, and I know the demands are great. But as, a, as an HR professional, just handing a lump of money, unless that's been costed and appropriately kind of outlined as far as a compensation philosophy and how that impact has down the line and up the chain, um, I think has to be carefully studied before it's implemented. So implemented. just a possible suggestion is you guys ask the school board to start looking at a structure like that that they could propose to you possibly for the next year. But I would leave that to the HR professionals and the compensation professionals. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask Vice Chair Sawara to take over because I apologize. I've got a plane to catch. Um, but keep this conversation going because I think we want to understand the, the possibilities here. Can I ask a follow-up question? So, Council Member Gamble, you're, you're recognized. Thank you. While we're changing so, it, it, last year we did an increase uh, well, for, in the budget for teachers to get a, a raise and be the highest paid in the state. Was there a study done for that? And, and was the, did we have the same implications? And how does that factor in? They got an increase. So and the, most of the paraprofessionals and support staff are, re, I guess, reporting to them. How does, that, um, how does that impact that we did give a raise to teachers last year influence kind of the, 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 the compression situation that you're describing? So I can't really address that because I don't work for schools. So I have no idea whether or not. Now, I will say I absolutely assume that they conducted a pay study that put out a schedule so that you didn't have less tenured teachers making more than more tenured teachers, right? So that pay study. And I, I, um, I care deeply about support staff and non-certificated because they're actually in our benefit system. So we, out of Metro HR and the Employee Benefit Board, support the support staff from a benefits perspective. Um, so I would absolutely recommend, whether it's teachers, whether it is the support staff, that an appropriate pay study to do compression and what I do mean by that, and it could be in several different forms. What you don't also want is someone who is a less tenured uh, cafeteria worker who all of a sudden is making more than their supervisor right, that may be in a different classification. I don't know the entire classification structure, but I assume that there are different levels of classification uh, for each of the support staff employees. You just want to be mindful so that you don't inadvertently create inequities, right? You want it to feel fair when you implement it. I am absolutely supportive of people making a living wage both here and at MMPS. But just, uh, just to be mindful, you should be very thoughtful to make sure you're addressing those issues because some of these people don't just report to teachers, right? It may be more simple in like a paraprofessional component, but then you'd also want to make sure, are there different levels of paraprofessionals? Do those people, do there, is there a reporting structure um, that's outside of the teacher component? Um, I, you just want to be really careful so that you don't have unintended consequences where things don't feel fair. That's my only caution. Just one more, I'm sorry. So if we uh, allocated this funding and made, put it upon MNPS to, to figure out how to distribute it according to the classifications and, 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 and um, um, what do you call it, the, the tiers of, of payment. I guess, is that something that, from an HR perspective, can be done uh, prior to the start of the school year? Just my personal experience, and I don't know the the staffing or the compensation at, at specialists that are at schools. Um, that would be impossible for my team to do. 
Um, we just so that you know, as soon as you all adopt your budget, we then feverishly work to get all employees placed because a lot of them are going to get a COLA 7-1. Many employees have an anniversary date or a performance evaluation date of 7-1 and then increment dates could be throughout the year. Um, we're pushing that and almost immediately starting to prepare for the pay plan we bring you next year. Like by August, we are knee deep in, okay, what do we need to study? Let's start reaching out to departments. Are there recruitment or retention issues? Should we be looking at market data to make sure? And in this particular case, I feel like things have changed a bit even for everyone, right? The ability to hire and retain employees is kind of a global across all lines of business, public and private. Um, so really, uh, you know, it, it's, we, while we want to be market competitive, we have to make sure we can actually pay the right rate to actually put the bodies in the seats. That's been more of a challenge for our organization and probably many of the organizations you guys work with as well. You bring up a good point about retaining employees and that's the fear too, is that as we continue to push this, put this off, we're losing valuable employees that can't afford to stay in the MNPS system and live here in Nashville. So we need to consider that as well. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to add a question. Uh, is it where something like that can be done mid-year, in your professional opinion? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Mid-year? Mid-year. As long as it wasn't legally precluded. I mean, I'm aware of, I don't know if the last couple of years, I thought it was a couple of years ago that there was a, a mid-year adjustment, I think, for schools. Mm -hmm. So. I, depending on their capacity and how many changes they're talking about and how significant they are, that's possible. I think what I would recommend is that we follow up with MNPS and we are assuming they don't have a study. Uh, when I did my budget conversation with them, they said they picked the bus drivers and nutrition staff because those are the ones that are very difficult to fill. Not necessarily that they did not do the other people. So uh, I think we need to follow up with MNPS if they have the study already and if they can give us that number and then we can also follow up about question about media and all that stuff. But thank you for your uh, professional expertise. It helps. All of us that were very excited and, and emotional about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other comments on? If, oh yes, ma'am. Uh, if, if it's helpful, there is a study. So sorry, Thank I just you. want to put a couple of facts <laughs> on the table. That's all I know. I'm not involved in that study, so I don't. I'm gonna just only put a couple of facts. I know there was a support pay study that looked at various support uh, employees. Um, that study uh, was conducted. Uh, and that there is data in that study that looked at not just compensation numbers, but also looked at uh, uh, vacancies, uh, recruitment, uh, things like that. And so those are components of that study and there are additional classes in there. I, I don't know from the data set how, where we got to, and that's why I think MMPS is best positioned to speak to this because what they asked for from us in their budget, it was approximately $10.4 million. We funded. So in that 91 plus million dollars we talk about going to M MMPS, there is 10.4 million, which is funding for support pay for support staff that is above the COLA and the step increase that is also going to support staff. And so those are just the only facts I know and I'd recommend, but there is a, there's a study that exists and, they, and my, my recommendation is, is for MMPS to come and speak to how they went from the data set from the study to that 10.4 million. And if there's anything excluded from it, that's worth discussing. Thank you, Council Member Toomes. Thank, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I um, agree with Ms. Wilson. We should ask for some official clarification from MMPS. So when the Minority Caucus met yesterday, we did reach out to a representative of MMPS, or well, of the school board, and uh, there was no like pushback on the nine million. We were told that the nine million would work to fund the increases that we're looking for for support staff. But I think some official documentation really outlining what that $10.4 million is for, what classifications of positions that covers, and then what's, what's missing. Thank you. Uh, any more on the nine million? Okay. Thank you. Um, going down, there's advocacy centers and coaches, Council Member Toombs. Thank you, Vice Chair. I actually reached out to that same representative from the school board and they are going to be able to cover that with ESSER funds. Okay. So we can take that out? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Councilmember Welch, you have uh, school meals, um, classroom needs, and 10% COLA. Um, yes, and these are very truly, really wish list items that um, I know the uh, possibilities of getting it. But I feel like it's very important that we make sure that we are providing free meals to our children. We have so many um, children um, living very near the poverty level and attending our public schools, getting free and reduced priced meals because they need to. Um, when we're talking about the uh, the pace for like the support staff, and we're saying that many, many people in Nashville are not making living wages, prices are increasing. I think it's very, very important that we are giving the basic things to our students so that they can learn the best. Um, I also um, would love to see the creation of some sort of classroom fund that would allow teachers not to have to put money out of their own pocket to cover things that they need for their classrooms. If we know how the world changes throughout the school year and there might be additional educational materials that teachers would love to have or the school system would love to have, I would love to see that there was a fund that, that student, that um, teachers and administrators could reach into to fund these things as we go throughout the year. And then um, I do appreciate that we are talking about um, a 5% COLA increase for Metro workers, but we know that we have especially within the school system, neglected many of these workers for many years and they were left behind. And I would really love to see them actually get a 10% COLA since the cost of living right now is eight, going up 8% to at least take some of the pressure off them. And so they really feel like they actually have some extra money in their pocket. So that's where those items come from. Uh, and uh, the funding sources? Uh, mainly um, MNPD, the police department, because I feel like they have received a lot of money through ARP funds and are, have such a huge increase and have had an increase in the entire time I've been office that I feel like it, perhaps it's better that we uh, redirect some of those funds to things that I think also provide um, and add to public safety in a very different way. And I see debt service in here too, so and we've been told we cannot do that. Uh, that would, that should actually be fund balance. I changed it when they told me that that wasn't okay. going to work. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Parker. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. So I, I, I had the seven and a half million for nutrition services. Um, it was mislabeled as Porterfield on here, but it's correct on the other end. Um, I had also put that in uh, as a, with a fund balance as a source, um, you know, sort of understanding that I think we're already approaching the limits of what we might be able to um, uh, utilize fund balance for. And also, um, you know, I was talking with schools folks, and I think they're going to make an attempt to get this covered with ESSER funds if the state will. Uh, permit that. Um, if that uh, is unsuccessful, then I, I think it, it might be worthy of consideration for ARP funding, um, if that's possible. I'm not on that committee or understand super duper how that works, but um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's feasible to, to, to cover this with fund balance. So um, you, you all can cross that one off of, off of my wish list, although I did want to sort of highlight it and make sure that everyone was thinking about getting that funding to Nutrition Services Fund so that we can continue to, to not have uh, meal fees for our students. Thank you. Um, and I see there's uh, raises for school board. Um, this is uh, Councilmember Rosenberg. Uh, not here. All right. We'll keep going. Um, the next is administrative. Um, and we're looking to different uh, organizations. I have Adventure Science Center. I have a neighbor to neighbor and I have sister cities. Uh, I'll start with Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, as it states there, this is to restore sister cities to their previous grant level. Um, it's just $20,000. I think I initially put it as the 4%. That might not be the appropriate way to go about it. I didn't want to impact any particular department. Um, so I know we're going to be getting a, uh, a report from uh, judgments liabilities and self-insured liability fund to s see where we stand on that it might, might be the more appropriate way to go but the pitch of course is that sister cities offers opportunities and experiences that uh, uh, no other organization does and our, our students are experiencing that uh, right now um, so i would love to see our partnership uh, with sister cities be restored to the previous level um, they do a lot with uh, a little Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councilmember Styles. there's design for design study for Antioch Performing Arts Center and a study on Harris housing. Yes, so actually <clears throat> in speaking with the planning department, 
these can actually come out of the, the capital spending that we did in the fall. Okay, so we can check it out and it's the same thing for the minority caucus. It's the same list. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to community support and there's a whole bunch in here. Uh, Councilmember Benedict, I think she left. She's gone. All right. Uh, Councilmember uh, Gamble, Nashville grad, $1 million. Yes, thank you, Ch Vice Chair. Nashville Grad is a program from uh, the Nashville State Community College. It's a stipend that students can receive to take care of things. While we have uh, Tennessee Promise where um, students can go to the two-year college for free, it doesn't cover anything like books and technical fees and laptops. This uh, Nashville Grad program provides a, a stipend to those students so that they can afford those things, or students that need it can afford those things. This program has been funded at, at well, last year was funded at $1 million. About uh, 600,000 of it has already was spent in FY 2021. And uh, I've talked with uh, Dr. Shana Jackson, president of Nashville State, about the FY 2022 projections, and they're projecting that they will have spent at least $750,000 of the $1 million. Mm -hmm. However, uh, they are, they had a loss, a drop of enrollment over the last two years because of COVID, of course. Uh, they are projecting to increase enrollment, and they just recently uh, opened a new campus in, Mad in Madison that will uh, also increase enrollment. So I'm requesting that we uh, continue that the current level in the mayor's budget is at 500,000. So it's been cut to a level that's less than what they spent this year for FY 2022. So I'm uh, requesting that the funding level be restored to $1 million uh, as it was in the previous year so that they can accommodate at the very least as many students, about 375 students they accommodated this year with the idea that that number will increase with the new campus and new enrollment in that area. And so it has one million here. Your request is not one million dollars. Your request is actually five hundred thousand. And what is your funding source? Um, I like your source better, so I'm going to go with <laughs> what you have. <laughs> okay, we'll go with my source. <laughs> and I also have the 500,000 in there to bring it back to a million. And I think that we need to keep encouraging people to go to school and education is not the place that we should be cutting under any circumstance. And so uh, the 500,000 is coming from the technology review. Uh, that's where I have mine coming from. Um, so the next ones we have is the Community Resource Center and Anson Nashville. We've already talked about that. And then we talk about the MC3. We've already talked about that. Uh, next on that is another one of mine, which is the Pencil Foundation. Uh, and I think that Councilmember Welch actually teed it up perfectly for me when she says that there should be a fund where teachers can go when they need supplies and they need uh, things in their classroom. Uh, that's what Pencil Foundation does. Pencil Foundation has a warehouse of supplies and classroom things that teachers can go across the city and get what they need. Uh, they've opened up another location in uh, Antioch uh, and they're really helping MMPS in so many ways and our teachers are, take, are making good use of it and we don't directly fund them. I know they, they work with MMPS and get some money from MMPS, but having worked with that organization, I'm hoping that we can add 200,000 to their funding and my funding source for that one is uh, something called master space planning. We have this one million in our budget to look at spaces where we need people to sit and things like that, that I think would not mind taking 200,000 for something that will continue to help our schools. Uh, Councilmember Hancock. I just want to second the support for Pencil Foundation. You know, they're one of the only foundations in Nashville that exclusively serves Nashville, exclusively the public schools, the kids that need it. So I think that, you know, our money couldn't be better spent. Thank you. Oh. Unless you're going to say we can take the money. <laughs> when you're yes, thinking about both that study as well as we talked about the ITS study, um, some of them kind of don't work, right, you know, for a smaller amount. So I, I'm when we're thinking about it, I think maybe it's an either or an or, which is a weird thing to say, mm. instead of a little bit from each. And just, 
No, I'm saying from the studies. So, so you know, the master planning study, uh, what's the total amount? Yeah, the, it's a million dollar yeah. master planning study. Yeah, I'm not sure we could do it for a half. In the same way for the ITS, I'm not sure we could just take half of it and cut it off and still get the work product that we need. Mm. So it might be one or the other oh, instead okay. of a little bit from each. Just okay. I understand. So we can either do the ITS study or do the master planning and then keep the other one till another time. Okay. Yeah. That works that, as long as we get the I meeting. don't know, but I'm just, <laughs> let, us, let us do a little more homework on that. I, I just that. don't, there's definitely not enough wiggle to just hack it in half and uh -huh. make it work. But maybe, uh, but clearly the, the wish list is robust. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Director. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so the next one is... Uh, the Hills program, I believe we talked about that already. Uh, Pencil Foundation, Minority Caucus is the same one. Uh, Pencil Foundation, MC3, and Nashville grad. Councilmember Tom? Same. Same, same. thing? Yep. Okay, all right, we'll keep going. Um, then we have economic development. Uh, Councilmember Welch wants 15 million added to bonds fund. And I think Ms. Wilson mentioned something for housing, 30 million something, is that same thing or different thing? Uh, you'll recall when the mayor did his uh, state of Metro, he mentioned there's 30 million for affordable housing for ARP funds that he will be bringing forward. Those are not in our operating budget. That said, you have a fact sheet um, and on affordable housing, and it speaks to it's over $20 million that we have going towards affordable housing in this budget, um, which uh, I, I know that this is a really deep need. And like I said, you can essentially see that we're trying to take every source we possibly can and work work with what, as far as we can. Um, and so, uh, so anyways, the fact sheet, though, speaks to what's in the operating budget. There is also a 30 million request that will be bring be starting to be contemplated by the COVID Financial Oversight Committee on Wednesday of next week, and that's on top of the 55 million that was already funded through the COVID Financial Oversight Committee. Thank you. Uh, and it appears as if that is the last item. The other papers are just extra papers. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for notes <laughs> that's what they're for uh so thanks everyone for for joining our next meeting will be next week monday. will be on monday monday is okay all right so monday will be here and tuesday will be upstairs uh thank you much for being here we joined This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.